All right, let's, uh, let's, oh, we're recording this. Good call, Rustam. Um, all right, let's rock and roll. I'm gonna let let's people in. What up, everyone? How's everyone doing tonight? You guys can comment in the chat where you're from, where you guys coming from, how you guys doing. And yeah, I'll let, let you guys get in and we'll get rock and rolling. Where are you coming from? That's the important question. I'm in Puerto Rico right now. I don't know See, if you knew dude, that. You, you never knew. You never know where you're at, man. That's why we got to ask. I'm Roman, man. I got to keep them guessing. We got the 4% sales tax down here. Or not sales tax. We got the 4% flat business tax. So in America, if you make 100000 you have to pay 30000 in taxes. Here, if you make 100000 you pay 4000 in taxes. But you have to live here for six months out of the year. So work, working with Mr. Airbnb arbitrage over here to maybe potentially get a place down here. That's Taylor Jones <laughs> official on the couch. And Rustin, if you can keep letting people in, that would be amazing. We might max out tonight, guys. I'm, I'm curious. Just to, I'm, what do you say? I'm curious if anybody else here is from uh, Pennsylvania. I'll get some shout outs. I bet we do have some Pennsylvania people oh, in the chat. We got Rake and Profit in the chat. Oh, yeah. oh we got in Pennsylvania. What's up, Damien? Hey, man. Yeah, I grew up in Ohio, but my I had family in Pittsburgh. So I spent a lot of summers in Pittsburgh, lifeguarded there, and wound up going to Penn State. So I enlisted right after high school. I was living in, in Pittsburgh for that summer. They let me choose between Ohio or Pennsylvania. And Ohioans pay tax no matter where they're stationed. Pennsylvanians only pay tax if they're stationed in state. Mm. So naturally, I chose Pennsylvania, but four tax returns later, by God, it was Pennsylvania. So I would have had to pay out of state to go to Ohio State, but Pennsylvania State was in state. So, gotcha. up yeah, Pennsylvania up has uh, no clothing sales tax as well. True. Yeah, I'm in we'll the get Des in the house. Des, do uh, Rustin, do you want to make Des like a co-host? Wait, I'm sorry. So, yeah. All right, guys, let's let's dive straight into it. Our first speaker. So first of all, the schedule for tonight. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Walk you guys through this. We have Mike the Use Book Guy up first. You don't like it. Let's see how good my memory is on this schedule. This is gonna be a three hour event. We have six speakers total. They have 30 minutes a piece. Uh, when they get done talking, we will open up Q&A, so you guys will be able to ask questions. So here's the schedule real quick. 5.30 to 6, we got Mike the Use Book Guy. Make sure to follow him on YouTube. You guys can just type in Mike the Use Book Guy. Uh, this, I asked him if he wanted to share his sales numbers, and he said, I, you know, I don't like it when people talk big numbers because everyone can inflate their numbers. But at the end of the day, the important thing is how much do you pay the IRS? <laughs> Not really, but it's how much profit are you taking home at the end of the day? Um, so yep. he will be talking about creative strategies for finding more books. And he's just an all around hustler. He runs a business out of a storage unit. He'll be up basically right oh, wow. now. After him, we have Omer who sells 4 million a year, at a pretty healthy profit margin. And he'll teach you guys how to land bulk deals and um, also opportunity for Q and A. We got Johnny Flips who will share travel sourcing methods. You guys, you guys can make money on the road, which is 100% a tax write-off. You can uh, write off your miles at 50 cents a mile or something like that, Google it. But in 2018, I wrote off like a ridiculous amount, like $30,000 in write-off. I'm not, I'm not condoning this, but um, I only did 80,000 in sales that year, so I barely paid any, any tax at all. Uh, I'm not a CPA. Don't ask me for, for tax advice. Then I'm going to give my exact repricing strategy and I will actually email you guys a, uh, a free course. Uh, since you showed up to this, uh, I'll email everyone a free course because what I'll be covering is it's not advanced, but it's techie. Um, so I will lay that out to you step by step, but I'll cover more of the theory and we'll do Q and a as well. Russell, if you can make sure people are muted, I hear somebody uh, unmuted. Then we got Rake and Profit. He's going to share how he did 90K in profit last year, 300,000 in sales, uh, flipping from eBay to Amazon. And then we have Joji, who is a chemistry teacher who sells six figures annually uh, with textbook flips. So super smart guy. And yeah, 
So let's dive into it. Welcome, Mike, the used book guy. If you want to introduce yourself one more time for everyone who doesn't follow you. And Rustam, if you could drop his YouTube channel in the chat, that way everyone can go over and subscribe to his channel. Let's show him some love. What's going on, everybody? Uh, my name is Mike, as you already heard three times. Um, I know I kind of said, you know, I don't like coming off as like, oh, I'm a six figure, seven figure, eight figure seller. But just for reference, I have sold over a hundred thousand dollars last year on between Amazon and eBay when it comes to selling media. So I'm, you know, I have a little bit of experience doing this. Uh, my primary focus is Amazon, but eBay is a crucial part of, you know, any book business, in my opinion. Um, I'll give you a little bit of backstory here before I kind of dive into some things. I started like a lot of people, right? You just go on YouTube, you just search out different ways to kind of, you know, make money on the side. And for me, I was working at CBS as a store manager, hated my job, working all these hours. Came across Romer, believe it or not, he interviewed somebody, John Muscarella, another, he used to be a bulk book seller. And uh, believe it or not, he lives 20 minutes from me. And, you know, it was a whole interview of, hey, I'm making a full-time income selling books in central Pennsylvania. So I'm like, hold up, wait a minute, I'm central Pennsylvania, I can do this, right? So that was kind of like the, the eye-opening for me. And I started out like anybody, right? Going to thrift stores and it just takes time to build this business up. So tonight you're going to hear everybody here has a ton of experience. Everybody here has a completely different business model. So when I was starting, I was kind of like, you know, almost trying to replicate somebody else's business. But I realized pretty fast that what Romer does might not be the best thing for Mike, but there's different pieces you can take away from these businesses that are going to help your business grow and you're going to get different things from it. So I basically, one day I was working at CVS. I built this business up on the side. And when I started, my goal was to send one box every two weeks into Amazon. So back then, I really didn't know what I was doing, right? There wasn't a lot of content creators around media. And I was just like, hey, I'll send one box every two weeks. If I make extra money, I make extra money. And I, I built it up on the side. And one day at work, the middle of my shift, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon, I left my keys on the table, walked away from that job, and I never looked back since. And I've just been, you know, knee deep selling books. And over on my YouTube channel, I basically documented my journey from the beginning. And I take pride in, I, I've literally responded to every single YouTube comment that I have ever gotten on the channel. So it's uh, kind of where, you know, I just see it as if I can help somebody else get out of a situation like I was in, like, hey, you're, you're not happy with your job or you need to make extra money, then that's the whole reason, you know, why we create this content and put it out there for other people is basically to help somebody else get out of a situation they really don't want to be in. So that kind of covers like my, my backstory. I'll kind of cover a little bit of my business here. So like I said, I'm mainly Amazon, but I do also, you know, I have to have eBay, right? When we're doing, you know, books in bulk, we all know you can't sell a lot of the stuff on Amazon, right? No ISBNs. You're really not going to find a lot of that on Amazon. Autograph books, different kind of collectibles and antiquarian books are going to do much better on eBay. So that's why I have eBay. Personally, I, I I hate listing on eBay. Like once you get into Amazon, you're like, hey, this is convenient, right? You just put it in a box, send it off. There's no pack in orders, anything like that. So I have eBay. It is a necessary evil, you know, in the media business. But um, I basically started, you know, one box every two weeks for if you, you kind of sit down and think about it, I'm sure most people here are probably doing more than one box every two weeks. So everybody here is basically already ahead of where I started. Right. So you already have the, the, the building blocks to grow a business, six figures, seven figure, figures, whatever it may be. And you just have to. The biggest thing with this business is consistency. Uh, and it's hard to it's hard to nail down at the end of the day because you got to get up. Every day, you got to put time into business and be consistent with it because we all know the more you send to Amazon, the more you're going to sell. If you if you stop sending stuff for months, then you're not going to you know see the results. And I'll give you a prime example of this. So last year, I was right around 5,000 items in inventory when restock limits hit. So basically from September all the way up until probably the middle of February, I couldn't send in a single shipment to Amazon FBA. So basically, sure, the sales keep coming in, but it's a, a slow decline. And it goes to show that if you're consistent, your, your numbers are going to keep going up. But when you can't be consistent within different rules that, that may happen, like restock limits, you're going to see the decline. So it, it, it just goes to show you have to be consistent in this business. And with something like restock limits, it kind of made me think about my whole business model and how I can kind of counteract restock limits, because I don't ever want to be in a situation like that again, right? I'm rocking and rolling 
my monthly sales are going up highest they've ever been. And then all of a sudden, you know, Amazon slams the door. So I just kind of wanted to get that out there. If anybody's, you know, new or just getting started or even a few months, maybe a year into this, everybody you see tonight was in the same position you are currently sitting in. We all started from nothing. We all started, you know, a box, two boxes a week. And you just, you just build upon that. The, the important thing is being consistent with your business. And you're going to get the results with Amazon. I mean, no matter what you're doing, if you're consistent, you're going to get results. Can you elaborate on restock limits? What's the issue or problem? So basically, fourth quarter Amazon sellers, everybody that's kind of been doing this, Amazon will say, hey, we only want fast moving items in our warehouse. So whether or not, you know, for example, me, when I had 5,000 items, they cut my limits down to 1,000. So until you get under their, their limit they give you, you can't send anything in. I'm sure... Uh, Romer, why don't you give your perspective on restock limits this past year for you? Yeah. Are you familiar with the capacity limits that just happened? Okay. Yep. So first of all, all my experienced booksellers, I want you to comment in the chat. Did the capacity limits help you or did they hurt you in terms of space? Put they helped if they helped you. Put they hurt if they hurt you. Gina says helped. They helped me tremendously. Helped, helped. No change. Um, I don't understand the capacity limits. I can quickly explain this. I just made a YouTube video on this, but restock limits is basically what Mike just said. They they start you at a thousand if you do well. My mom sent in a few books and they raised hers to 5,000 like pretty quickly, but that no longer exists. That was like three weeks ago. Now they have something called capacity limits, which is basically how much space are you taking up? This is great for media sellers and it's pretty good for booksellers too. But if you're selling CDs, DVDs, really good because a CD can fit in a smaller amount of space. Like a cubic foot, you can fit way more CDs than you can books. In a cubic foot, you can fit way more books than you can shoes. You know, shoes are their own category, but like a, maybe a bigger beauty product or something. So basically the difference now is it's by square footage rather than individual units, which I think overall, and according to the comments as well, this is brand new. Everybody's saying it's helped. Omer, are you here? I wonder if it helped Omer or not. That would be a good... That would be a good indicator. We'll we'll ask him when he, when he starts presenting. Well, Omer did four million in sales. Um, I'm curious with my bigger sellers how it affected them. But anyway, that's that's my two cents on that. Mike. And also, uh, do you want to do, do you want to flow in the Q and A, Mike? Like. Uh, we could have yeah, people yeah, on yeah. Just, just, just give a quick uh, little rundown here with these capacity limits real quick on uh, my, my two cents on it. So basically, it seems like the baseline here is 100 cubic feet for everybody, right? That kind of seemed to be the baseline. Some people are above it. Some people, I haven't seen anybody below 100. So if you kind of look at my inventory currently, I'm sitting around 1,400 items. That puts me at roughly 25 cubic feet. So if you times that by four, you're looking at roughly 5,000 items basically per media seller at 100 cubic feet. So that's kind of, you know, kind of give you the number versus just the cubic feet because, you know, you're not going to sit here and measure the cubic feet of your inventory, right? But that that, that can kind of be a number. 100 cubic feet is going to be roughly 5,000 books. Um, now, I am going to challenge you here and say that, you know, come Q4, these limits will probably not be 100 for everybody. I do not see them keeping a 5,000, you know, basically book limit on every single media seller. Again, I just don't think it's realistic. I think they're going to wind up tightening the screws like they always do. So today might seem great. You know, you have all of these, uh, all this space, you can send in whatever you want, but take it from experience. Don't be like Mike to use book guy where, you know, you have all this inventory, you're rocking and rolling. And then Amazon all of a sudden says, Hey, you know, we don't want none of your stuff no more. And you're kind of, you know, just sitting there. I mean, sure, it's nice. You keep getting paid for the, the five months. You're not sending anything, but you just think about the potential you're kind of missing out on. And I seen someone said in the chat, like, have I switched to Merchant Fulfilled? Uh, 100%. My, my Merchant Fulfilled now, my business is probably 80, 20, give or take 80% Merchant Fulfilled, 20% FBA. And my, my kind of anybody that uses Scout IQ or Scoutly, um, not sending anything FBA that's under a 20 E score or sales score. So it has to sell these 20 times every six months for me to be willing to send that in. Now, last year before the restock limits and my business model changed, I'd be willing to send something in with one E score. So that's kind of my whole business is kind of flipped upside down and uh, kind of takes us into the storage unit of me. You know, I had a storage unit before this. I live in a third floor apartment, so I really don't have like a space, right? Everything you see behind me here is blurred out. 
my wife has a, a business that she runs out of the apartment and uh, that kind of takes up a lot of space. So I had to, I had days where I would buy 5,000 CDs in bulk and I would have to carry them all the way up three, three sets of steps, scan them, take them all the way back down. And it just got to a, a point where I probably should have got a storage unit, you know, sooner, but I'm a cheap guy, right? You know, I want to be as cheap as I can, no matter what. So I waited for a good deal. It was like, I think I, when I got it, it was $92 a month for a 10 by 10. And if I would have got it right away, they were going for like $150 a month. So um, I kind of just pulled the trigger. I waited a little bit, got a good deal. And now I kind of operate out of there, right? So whenever I have a bulk buy, I take it there. That's where I deal with everything. That's where I keep the merchant fulfilled stuff. I mean, I don't have a crazy size warehouse, but I challenge you that you don't need to have a crazy size warehouse to make money merchant fulfilled. You don't even need a lot of space. One or two bookshelves uh, from Target. I actually went to Target to buy another bookshelf because I ran out of space today. They sell nice bookshelves for 37 bucks. Uh, super nice, adjustable shelf height so you can make them, you know, for your bigger books, your CDs, your DVDs, you can't beat it. So um, I'm just putting this out there. So if, if you're doing all FBA now and you max out your inventory, start thinking about merch and fulfilled. You kind of can make it super easy on yourself and just, you know, streamline the process. And it's almost as easy as FBA. And I would challenge you that, you know, if you list a book Merchant Fulfilled that has a 150 plus e-score versus FBA, you can sell that book within 20 minutes versus FBA. It's going to take three weeks for it to get checked in. The price may go down and the fees are less Merchant Fulfilled. So if anybody has any questions along those lines here, um, I'm, I'm all ears. I can answer anything and everything you guys can throw at me here or give you at least my two cents. Yeah, let's get a few people to unmute yourself. So we'll start with the people with their cameras on. If you have a question for Mike, just raise your hand and I'll ask you to unmute yourself. We got Tina, my, my bad, I muted myself first. Uh, Tina, if you wanna unmute yourself, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Ask to unmute. You okay, should be able right to get okay, boom. Okay, all set? Yep. Okay. Um, when you do merchant fulfilled, do you cross list it with the eBay and Amazon? For you, Mike. Whoops, did I do it? You still there, Mike? You're uh you're muted. <laughs> I would just leave yourself unmuted for now. You're still muted. Let me uh okay, hey, listen, muted. I got muted, all right. I didn't choose the mute light. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, team, watch out for that. Don't don't um, mute people unless. It's all right. Uh, no, I do not cross list. Personally, eBay for me is books that are don't have ISBNs. I don't I don't think there's any value in kind of cross listing unless you're doing this at a scale that's just crazy. Um, even Merchant Fulfilled compared to eBay, you, the prices you're going to get on Amazon are going to be a lot higher Merchant Fulfilled than eBay. If you go on eBay and look up so many, like all the books, basically, it's just huge sellers that use stock photos. So I honestly think there's really not a not a market for it unless you're doing this at a volume that's basically truckloads. That's the only way it would make sense. And you're just looking to make a dollar per book. OK, so you you your FBA is 20 or above. Below that would be merchant. Correct. Okay, and, thank and, you. And, and, and the lower profit moving stuff I'll merchant fulfilled over FBA. So my FBA minimum profit trigger for Scoutly and Scout IQ is uh, ten dollars. So that might seem high to some people, but. I would challenge you with the new fees, you know, it's going to cost, just look at the removal fee increase. We went from 50 cents to, if it's a three pound book, you're going to pay close to $4 to have it removed. So there's been a lot of changes kind of in the, in the book business. And that's why I kind of raised my profit triggers a little bit and the e-scores to go right along with it. So if it's a slower moving item, maybe it's your six or $7 profit item, we'll list it merchant fulfilled instead of FBA, just to be sure that we don't, we're not going to incur any extra fees. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right, so if you guys have questions, okay, we have, if you guys could raise your hand, use a raise your hand feature, um, that'd be amazing. That way we can have kind of a, a queue of questions, but we'll get Deneen next, if you wanna unmute yourself. Boom. Hi, can you can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, Mike, this question, hi, hi Avery. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> Avery's old news. Mike, quick question for you. What is your comfort level with the disparity between merchant fulfilled pricing and Prime, for instance, I see a lot of the newbies matching Merchant Fulfilled, which makes me want to scream. But I'm also noticing the queues in Scout IQ post new management are giving green lights when a book is obviously tanked when there's $9,005 Merchant Fulfilled offerings. Nobody's going to pay $40. 
I swear to God, you're distracting me, Taylor. Nobody's going to pay $25 on the FBA side if they can get 19 very good copies of $5 each. So what is, is it 20%? What is your comfort level between FBA and Merchant Fulfilled if there even is one at this point? I, I don't, I, I agree with you. I don't think there really is one anymore. And I, I kind of said in my last few videos, I think the days of just scanning and listening, I think you got to kind of do a deep dive on these books you're, you're going to buy before you buy them. Um, there, and you see it more and more now. It used to be the buy box would always go to the FBA offer, regardless of the price difference between Merchant Fulfilled and FBA. But now more and more, you see that the FBA or FBA offer is not getting the buy box compared to the Merchant Fulfilled offer. So when I'm out scanning, I'm always looking at my phone. I'm always double checking my buys because we can't afford to make, you know, like last year I had a thousand books removed. Well, that only cost me five, $500, we'll say total at 50 cents a book. Well, this year, if I have a thousand books removed, I'm looking at over 2000 thousand dollars in removal fees oh i get that so so I we can't that. afford to you know play the game where you know it's fine if 80 percent sells and 20 percent doesn't because at scale that doesn't work anymore with the new fees so you have to kind of do a little bit more of a little bit more of a deep dive when you're looking at it and if you see something like the situation you're saying 100 percent if it's if it doesn't have you know maybe it's justified if there is at least a 20 sales score e-score because you know it's actually actively selling Anything lower than that, if there's a disparity like that, I 100% would leave it regardless if it says to buy it or not. Or, I mean, you, you know what you're doing. You said it yourself, right? You see the $40 FBA and, and the merchant fulfills are eight bucks. There's no way you're ever going to get that sale. You know, maybe you get lucky, but overall, I don't think it's going to happen anymore like it used to. I just got back into books and I burned myself on a few sales because I was whizzing through, saw the green light, saw the e-score. Now I get, you know, I'm just going to liquidate them at this point. I'm not even paying to have them returned. Yeah. I just, just, you know, take, take the loss and move on and just, you know, just, just pay a little bit more be a little bit more mindful of what you're buying. You know, I'm not walking out of stores with Ikea bags full of books anymore because I'm not chasing the, you know, the, the five, $6 stuff. I'm going for the higher stuff. So if it does tank a little bit, there's still money to be made and just, just, you know, get a little bit smarter with it and just, you know, try different things and, I definitely, if there's a disparity and it's under a 20 e-score, I definitely would not touch it at all, FBA. Thank you. No problem. Matthew, you're up next. Be nice if you had a camera, but we'll violate the policy and let you go. Boom, there he is. You got to mute. You got to mute yourself, though. So this seems like a relatively simple question, but I have not been able to do it. I cannot get ungated for CDs and DVDs. And I'm not sure what they're looking for to get ungated. Are you, um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what, what steps have you taken so far? I've gone and I've gotten a, a, uh, an invoice from a distributor. I submitted it and they say it's not good enough. And so I'm like, what are you looking for? They said, we needed the invoice from a distributor. So it's like, I got going around in circles, you know, I, not being able to get on gated. So I'm, I'm like, does anyone have a, 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 a distributor I could use that, that they know Amazon approves of that, I, that can get me on gated? I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you whipped into shape here real quick. Uh, everybody uses Christian book. That seems to be the cheapest one. Um, I have a YouTube video covering it, but basically when you are submitting your invoice, you kind of want to make this foolproof. You almost want to approach it that there's a first grader that's looking at your invoice and your items, right? So you want to make sure that it's 10 of the same item and you want to make sure you're, you're renaming the pictures, right? You don't want to submit it as JPG, whatever the date is. You want the name of that picture to be front of invoice, back of invoice, front of product, back of product. You basically want to make it foolproof so that if you know a 10 year old comes in and looks at your submission, that is going to get approved. And I will say the current record for people, because I have a, a YouTube membership and we have like a private media cell on Discord. Um, the current record is 12 times it took somebody submitting the same invoice to get ungated in DVDs. So it, it's kind of, I don't want to sit here and say it's random, but it, it honestly is. It, you're getting a different person every time. There, it's usually, you know, a bot that's just going to process the information right away. You can highlight the critical information like quantity 10, new because they want to see that it's new as well. You can highlight that and see if that makes a difference. I'm not sure exactly uh, what you have going on, but th those are some tips and tricks and it, it, and it may take, you know, 10 times for it to work. And what's the name of that website again? Christian book. It's super cheap. You can get, you know, a CD for $1.99, DVD $1.99. So you're 20 bucks plus shipping 
And uh, it still works because people comment on the YouTube video, you know, every other day saying they got ungated. So I can actively tell you that it still works today. Mm -hmm. 100%. We got Jessica up next. Appreciate you, Matthew. You got to unmute yourself. You're currently muted. <laughs> Click on the unmute button. It should be in the bottom left. There you okay, go. I did, I did click it there, but it wouldn't let me. Okay. Hi, used book guy. Um, What's up? Watch your videos all the time. Nice to meet you. And uh, I, I am wanting to do FBM. I haven't done it yet. I've just done FBA and I'm catching the same thing. I'm going, wait, this is a green, but this is going to sit there forever. And I don't even understand all the restock and capacity stuff yet. So I have books to liquidate. I went on to liquidate them. Um, I had about 60, 70 to liquidate. Where can I get guys? Where can I get information on liquidating? Because it said something about liquidating in bulk versus liquidating. I don't know. Maybe by checking the boxes, is there a difference? And where do I get more information? Because you may not be able to go into it now. I understand that, but where do you understand how to liquidate or what the prices are and all that stuff? Uh, removal fees is going to be where you can see the prices. If you if you just search in the Amazon toolbar up top. Uh, FBA removal fees. It'll pull up the whole article that breaks down how much it is, standard size, and then it goes off weight. So there's different tiers to the removal fees. It's nothing that's flat anymore. So it depends on how heavy the book is. So there's different fees. Um, other than that, you can only really see like how much you get liquidated, like when it when the item actually liquidates, if you go through your transaction report and it'll actually show you. But I mean, honestly, don't expect to get more than, you know, on, on average, it's probably around 15 cents per item you liquidate. So I know I'm not looking to make the money. I'm just trying to not spend a lot to get it out of there. So, so the way I do it, I usually go in, I sort my active inventory by the oldest, right? Because we don't want to incur the long-term storage right. fees yeah, and yeah. you just have to go page by page. So yeah. I'll go 50 at a time, yeah. select all the top left box, create removal order, liquidate everything I can, and then go to page two. Do the same thing, page three, and just work your way back until you're within the time That's frame. That's what that I was you're... doing. Is that the most economical way to do it? There's no you, better you way to do it. used to be able to bulk upload files. And I think since they changed their back end, it doesn't work anymore. Romer, you could probably back me up on this. When uh, when the, what was that tool that uh, the book flipper community had? That tool worked great because you could bulk upload it, but I don't think it works anymore. I'm not sure. You talking about bulk upload? I, I kind of zoned out for listing or yeah. the removal, okay. removal orders. Oh, removal orders. Uh, yeah, it still works. Um, their tool doesn't work. Restock.thebookflipper.com does not uh, work. It's not compatible with the FBA uh, okay. removal report anymore. But if you message my team at support at gotolister.com, Okay. Uh, we, we can help you make that report compatible. There's a new report you have to use and Caleb's basically like retired now. So he okay. doesn't, um, he, he's not going to update it. But if you guys do want uh, to use that tool, it's a great tool. I have a YouTube video on it. Um, but just message us at support at gotolister.com and say, hey, I want help rearranging my, uh, it, I think it's called the FBA report now, but we can make that compatible with the restock limit, uh, restock. It's dot restock.thebookflipper.com. You can go there, upload the report that my team will change for you. And then, yes, you can still do the manual upload in bulk. It still works. Okay. And then the only other question is, what would you recommend for just getting started with FBM? Because I was wondering, like, what's a good e-score to keep at home and what's a good e-score to, to send in? So thanks for giving the 20 uh, bookmark or the 20 e-score mark there. So What's the first step for FBM? You have, you have a good video on that that you would recommend? or I, I do. The most important thing is going to be setting up your shipping template. It's 100% the most important thing because if you don't do that, Amazon will make you ship priority mail. Um, and we as media sellers can't afford to pay $9 to ship a media item. So you have That's to set that looking. template up correctly um, okay. just so you get the media mail rates because it's not like eBay where you can choose your shipping service no matter what. Amazon will only list those ones that are is is you know beneficial to the customer. They don't care about the seller. They just want it to get to the customer as soon as you can. So the shipping template is going to be your most important thing. And yeah, I got videos that cover that as well. Great. I'll look. That. Thank you so much. All right, let's keep rocking and rolling. Let's get through a few more here. Real quick, um, go check out Mike's YouTube channel. He's going to have a better video on how to set up uh, shipping templates. But I actually have a video that shows you how to like list from home on a bookshelf 
merchant fulfilled like to be able to see all these so if you guys want to go to that video all my go-to lister users it's how to use go to lister to list but if you do use another listing software the principles remain true i show you how you can use boxes put them in your closet there's really two methods um, to do merchant fulfilled from home so i just dropped that video in the chat if you guys want to check that out and also uh, mike's going to have better videos on how to set up the shipping template so definitely go check out his channel for that all right who do we got next uh brinda and then we'll get Bruce. Mute me. There we go. Okay. Um, can you get us back to the screen where we see everybody? <laughs> there we go. Hi, Mike. Nice to meet you. I've also watched a lot of your videos, so it's a pleasure to meet you. But you know, I was wondering, instead of liquidating your books, is there a way to transfer from FBA to merchant fulfilled instead of liquidating or having them send them back to you you're going to have to have them sent back and then you can convert the listings to fbm um there th i mean there are benefits to having them sent back right if you maybe right. you have an ebay store or you have like a buyback company you can probably get some of your money back or if you need shipping supplies right because if you have a removal order for 200 books they're all not going to come in the same box you're probably going to get you know 50 different boxes sent to your house so if you need boxes that you can use for ebay or you know something else then 100 have them sent back to you i just liquidate it because i just i just don't want to deal with it and uh deb my wife should be like hey why we got all these packages showing up at the door i got five amazon boxes outside the door every day but you can convert your listings from fba to fbm okay thank you all right guys give mike some love in the chat i'll let you guys do that how you want you guys can leave hearts or whatever or i appreciate everybody supporting the channel coming out hanging out and like i said remember you know you're going to have a lot of different business perspectives tonight and just realize every single one of us was in the same situation you're in and every single one of us has a different business model so it's okay to build this business to, to suit your needs and you'll get the results as long as you put in the time and the work. 100%. All right, real quick commercial break. Uh, I do wanna talk about the giveaway we're doing tonight before we have our next speaker who does 4 million a year. Omer, come on. Uh, so it's actually my buddy right here. I found a uh, picture of him on Google. He, he reviews like printing softwares or printing printers. And this is, the wireless Rolo printer, it's $300 and we're gonna give it to one of you tonight. We have 300 people here currently, there's more people trying to get in. So if you guys leave, it's not guaranteed that you'll get your spot back. Uh, my Zoom account maxed out at 300. I didn't think we'd have 300 people show up. I've never had 300 people. So I have to upgrade my Zoom account again. But um, yeah, you guys must have a GoToLister account and you must be here live. So if, you, if you're here live at the very end and you have a GoToLister account, Go to Lister is the fastest listing software on the planet. You guys can check out more information on that. And I will be talking more about this in detail later, but you can scan this QR code and it'll pull up Go to Lister or just go to Go to Lister. That's number two.com. We are having profit analytics come out soon. So you'll be able to track your exact profit on Go to Lister. So as long as you've been entering your buy costs, let's say you went to Goodwill and your books were $2.50 on average, as long as you've been using Go to Lister buy costs religiously, your profit is going to be down to a T and not to talk down on the other book selling softwares that are in the market, but they do not tell you accurate profit analytics. Like they don't work at all. Uh, we've like studied the competition. The, the only, the ones that come close are, it's the reason why people pay for seller board. People pay for these other softwares because they do show uh, accurate profit analytics. So that's coming soon, but you guys must have a go to lister account. I'm going to have you guys comment your emails at the very end, and that'll put you in the running for a $300 Rolo printer. With that being said, up next, we have Omer out of Arizona currently. I went snowboarding with this dude. Uh, I didn't even realize how many books he sold. Like, if you go, if you scroll through his, his Instagram, if Rustin, if you could link his Instagram below, um, I'll, I'll link it to Rustam in a second if you can't find it. Book Upcycles his Instagram. If you scroll through his Instagram, he's doing like 70,000 in sales a month a few years ago. And now he's doing 4 million a year. So whatever 4 million is divided by 12, he's doing that much every month. He's going to help you guys. I get the question all the time. How do you land bulk deals? So he's put together a presentation. We may even let him go a little bit over because I know that this is probably what a lot, a lot of people want to hear. And he's our most qualified speaker tonight. So welcome, Omer. If you want to unmute yourself wherever you are. Where are you at, brother? 
everyone look for an Omer. What's his, what's his handle here? Has to unmute. You should be, be able to unmute yourself now. Boom. There he is. Hello. What's up? Man? How you doing? Good. How are you? Pretty good. I'll let you take it from here, brother. All right. Thank you for inviting me as a speaker. And thank you, Mike. That was very informative. Um, I made a presentation about how to land <clears throat> bulk deals. If you let me share my screen. You have permission now. Okay. Great. Okay, I want to start uh, introducing myself first. Uh, I am originally from Turkey and currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. I came to US in 2014 by myself. And my online journey started with eBay. Um, I have purchased some phone cases to resell on eBay, but that didn't work out. So I had to um, give it up on that product. And then started studying computer science um, at University of Missouri. And then in my first year in college, I found the gems. As Romer says, it's the best ROI items to resell online. And I have started traveling uh, thrift stores, bookstores, library sales, first in the St. Louis, my city. Uh, and then we expanded and then we started sourcing from 10 nearby states. In the beginning, uh, we, we started FBM, Merchant Fulfilled, and then I realized I could sell the same book as FBA and make a lot more money because um, this FBA program, Amazon creates um, great inconvenience. That way um, customers can pay extra. And then hired my classmate that was my first employee as a sourcer in 2016 and my Amazon account got suspended in 2018 and lost over 50K worth of books and started selling again in 2019, again, and hired more people to source and partnered up with a good friend and expanded the cherry picking operation in Phoenix, Arizona uh, from two states and then graduated uh, from college, University of Missouri in 2020, but didn't apply, didn't have a chance to apply for software engineering jobs. I stick to the game. In 2020, very unfortunate thing, COVID happened. Thrift stores were shut down, book fairs and library sales were canceled. So there was no way for me to source books. And at the time <laughs> we had a warehouse and people that source books. And it was the last semester to graduate from college. It was um, very stressful um, times. So I had to pivot the business model to something else so that we can source books again. That model was bulk model. Um, I have researched online about how to buy books in bulk. I watched a lot of um, YouTube videos. I found some uh, websites like Thrift Books has a um, website that sells books in bulk, but I was informed that that was a not good source to buy from. And then uh, I got, I researched deeper and contacted a lot of paper recyclers, thrift stores, nonprofit chains like Goodwill, Salvation Army, Savers, and asked for buying books, buying books in bulk. Um, after getting a lot of no as responses. Uh, some of them, some of them were saying kindly, we have enough vendors. We are not looking uh, new vendors to sell. Some of them are not authorized and they're saying straight be no. But I kept calling, we kept calling. And then we've purchased the first truck load of books in March, 2020. Also at that, at that time, uh, we started collecting books from public by posting ads on Nextdoor, Craigslist, and Facebook. You can see the uh, sample messaging on the right-hand side. We, um, we advertised this as a service, stating that if you don't have enough time to donate your books, if it's taking too much space at your home office, uh, just give us a call, let us know, we can come pick them up for free. And we really had great hauls. Uh, it was some of them were really profitable. And this was solution for my 
sourcing problem and bulk model became the bigger portion um, of the operation since then. The uh, first thing you, you need to do is reaching out after you um, determined, the, uh, you decided that you are gonna switch to that model or you can start from uh, straight with bulk model without doing cherry picking, it's up to you. First thing you need to do, you need to Google uh, research online, thrift stores, paper recyclers in your state and start calling, um, uh, asking for an authorized person. You, it's usually the warehouse manager and tell them that you need to buy in bulk. Hey, um, I have a business. I want to buy like a couple of Gaylords at a time or a full truck load. The the more uh, volume you ask, that increases the chance of getting yes from that source because they want the convenience from the potential lenders. They want to um, make some space at the warehouse. So having the full truck load converts better. Also, you need to, sometimes they don't pick up the phone. Uh, by the way, it's the best time to call them is in the morning because they got busier in the afternoons. You need to call in the morning. Um, if you cannot reach anybody, you can do cold calling, you can email them, but you need to track that somehow. Um, and you can see in the bottom, the sample spreadsheet head, heading rows, um, he heading columns uh, that I had. For example, we were writing the company name, the person we talked to, what happened during this conversation and the contact number or email address and the current situation. Sometimes they say strictly no. Sometimes they say uh, we are looking for new vendors, but we don't have enough books to sell right now. Just call me back in two weeks or call me next month. And you need to write that down um, or on a piece of paper, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that you remember that time. I think uh, in my experience, best conversion rate is visiting them in person and meeting them in person. Let me give you an example. There was a source, it was a big one. We tried to reach with my business partner. Uh, we, we emailed that person. Um, we found him on LinkedIn. And then we visited the site like a couple of times. And finally, the guy um, agreed to meet us and then we started buying from them. Now we are buying one truck load a week from that source. So what you need to start this model, um, when you compare this model with cherry picking, it might require a little bit bigger space because uh, like when, when we were doing the chair picking model, we could do that in a small office space or from our uh, apartment. But for this model, you might need around 1000 square foot or less than a truckload. Or I know some people that has storage units uh, that buy a couple of Gaylords at a time. But if you want to go big, uh, start with the full truckload, I would say 2,500 square foot would be good enough to store that full truck load. And also you would need a, a pallet jack if you are buying a couple of Gaylords at a time with a box truck. But if you are getting a full truck load, this might require double stacking. That's why you might need forklift or pallet stacker. That would be a better option. And also to dump the box, you might need either box tilter or a box dumper. The tilter goes up to the 90 degrees and the dumper goes up to the 135 degrees. I would recommend um, Vestal brand for this box dumper I've been using for years and it's very solid brand. Um, of course, I know some people that are doing this uh, model without having none of those, just jumping straight into the Gaylord, um, I would say, we, we also tried this method. It's very time consuming, very labor intensive, and it's taking too much effort. So I would suggest getting one of those. And also you need a processing table and processing stations for manual scanning uh, so that you can scan each book to decide if you're gonna do uh, merchant fulfilled, 
or FBA or buyback <clears throat> companies like uh, Zipfit or Selbeck Your Book. And also you need some shelvings. Uh, I don't recommend getting a lot of shelves at a time. Uh, you can start a couple of shelves in the beginning and then you can go from there because uh, merchant fulfilled operation is a must in this business model because in cherry picking, you are buying what you are intending to sell. But in this business model, you are <clears throat> buying, you are paying everything upfront. So you need to make the most money out of it. That's why you might come across some items that is over six, seven million sales rank, but selling for over $100. Um, like we are selling those kind of books every single day. Um, yeah, FBM is crucial for this model. And if you have enough capital, I would suggest getting a conveyor sorter because this uh, speed things up. I'm very happy that uh, we got conveyor sorter. And also you need to find you need to find a paper recycling company and make an agreement with them because you're gonna end up a lot of end up with a lot of duds. Uh, you will have like in an average quality source, you will get 15 to 18 at top 20% uh, accept rate. So you will you will have a lot of books to get rid of. You can find a paper recycling company locally. Locally would be better because there is less freight cost. That means you might get paid more. Uh, and then you can sell those in bulk to get rid of those dots. <clears throat> and there might be some challenges that you might face in this model. Uh, the first common issue is the cash flow issues uh, because this is more labor intensive. Comparing to cherry picking model, uh, you're going to need a crew to uh, process those items. Growth is, of course, very important. Uh, growth, if you are not growing, you are shrinking, as they say. However, do not rush. <clears throat> do not rush for hiring and scaling. Uh, just uh, check your cash flow. This is very important because if you are out of money, there is no business left to grow. And the second challenge is unable, un, being unable to adopt the challenges, uh, changes. Uh, for example, there has been a restock limits in 2020 and a lot of businesses were shut down. This was a big change, uh, but the sellers that was able to adopt, they survived. Um, or in 2020, Amazon shut down the non-essential items for FBA. Everybody needed to switch to a uh, merchant fulfilled uh, model. And those, the ones that switched, survived. Um, I would recommend following the news about the Amazon and dynamically uh, make adjustments and changes your strategies accordingly. Also, stay connected to other resellers on so social media or in person. Some people avoid that uh, because of the competition, but I love the reselling community. I like even, even in Phoenix and St. Louis, I know a lot of resellers. I meet them regularly and talk about the changes in the industry. This, uh, because we learn from each other every single day. That's very important to me. And also making your employees happy is crucial. You don't, wanna, uh, you don't want your employees to quit. Uh, be nice to them and create a great work environment and they will work really hard. Uh, otherwise they're going to end up quitting and it's very, it's going to be very expensive to rehire them and, uh, retrain them. So treat your employees better. I just want to show this. So this is our sorter. I just wanted to put this video because it's so satisfying. I love to see this every single time. That's why I wanted to show you. So this, this uh, is the con conveyor sorter that I was talking about. Uh, we spent like more than 
a year to develop this um, piece of equipment, but it was definitely worth it. Um, it grew our capacity like at least 50-60%. And our current volume is we have two warehouses. We are operating from two warehouses from Phoenix and St. Louis, 7,000 square foot each, and we buy over 25 truck lots a month from both locations. And we sell around uh, 50K box retail and over 50K uh, as in wholesale. Our year to date sales is 1.7 mil right now. And we are projecting to have uh, hopefully 8 million in 2023. And the warehouse lease is gonna expire soon. And we're gonna get a bigger warehouse for each location. And hopefully we will get eight figures in 2024. Also, I want to talk about, I got Romer's permission to uh, promote this app uh, to help you guys. Uh, I have also co-founded uh, a software company in 2020 um, to create products for businesses B2B. And this is one of the products we have. This is a mobile database scouting app. And I wanted to create this special coupon for this event only. If you put uh, AMZ book club, in the referral code, you will get this application for free for six months. Because when you are starting, I know uh, even $20, $30 subscription is a lot to afford because you don't know if it's going to work out. You don't know if this model is best fit for you. So I thought it would be very uh, great idea to boost your business to having this uh, application for free and saving additional $30 to $40 a month on this uh, application. It has database, it's on Android, iOS, uh, and web. And it also, I'm gonna share those links by the way. It also has the, um, on iOS and Android, and it shows the average sales rank uh, because every sales rank is more crucial. It's more credible. It has the sold quantity, or you can say e-score as well. And also, uh, it, it is the most, most integrated scouting app with your Amazon selling account. As you see here, it's showing your orders, the sold items today. This is from one of my uh, Amazon accounts. It's showing the items that we sold and the condition, the fulfillment method. This is merchant, this is FBA. And also you can see if what date you have sold this item and for how much you sold it for. For example, this one, we sold it for today, March 16th, for $48, an FBA good condition, and we sold for 53 four days ago. And it's also showing you if you are gated on this item, this may avoid you uh, to lose some money on the item. Um, the ones that you cannot sell. Of course, you can send those items to Avery. He has a um, restricted inventory service, sometimes uh, you need to buy the book because this, for example, this one is $50. Even if you split the profit with Avery, it's definitely worth it. Conclusion, uh, for bulk model, it's harder to get into business. It would require a lot more capital than cherry picking, but it has uh, a lot bigger potential for scaling up. And also, I have Instagram account, Book Up Cycle. I try to share some content. We got it in the chat, bro. If you guys are watching, go ahead and, and follow Book Up Cycle on Instagram. We got the link. Rustin will post it again. Okay, um, that was it. Uh, I appreciate your time. Awesome. We can jump into some q and I'm sure uh, people have, have questions. Uh, I think the first question I want to ask for everyone is there's like a lot of people that are like, I feel like a little ant. I feel so insignificant, like compared to your sales. And um, what advice would you have for someone who like is just starting out with books, but maybe they do have aspirations for bulk? Uh, what what kind of advice would you have for them? Um, I would tell them to being uh, a little bit patient. They they might hurry up. Um, of course, I know some people that that started straight with bulk model, but of course there is going to be some mistakes uh, that you are going to make in during the during this journey. Uh, I would suggest you to uh, feel more comfortable with Amazon. Just know how Amazon works, the fee structures. Uh, if it's your first business, just 
uh, experience, a little bit time being a business owner, and then you can start um, small, like getting a couple yay lords at a time. I also know some people that are going to like Goodwill Clearance Center or re paper recycling uh, and then offering them, hey, I know you need to separate those books with by the hardcover and the paperback. Let me help you. Let me separate it. And just let me scan the books and let me take what I want. I also know some people are doing that. Um, so it's totally up to you. I would say just be patient a little bit, uh, make some sales, see the growth, and then you can start buying a couple of Gaylords. Or if you are very comfortable and if you have capital or partner up with someone, you can just get a warehouse and go into the full truck load. Someone was asking, is Booksy just for bulk or can everyday thrifters use it as well? And does this replace Scout IQ? Yeah, this would definitely uh, replace Scout IQ um, because it's free, first of all. Uh, th this is data. This is working with the database mod on books. Uh, and we are implementing the other categories as well. Uh, video games, CDs, DVDs is coming really soon. But, uh, but of course, you can um, search live for every category. Perfect. We got uh, three people. I really want to get them. We got one of our speakers asking a question. Johnny Flips, who's up next. Um, we'll start with Daniel. Daniel, if you want to unmute yourself. And, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was uh, just kind of a general question because I've seen in uh, some boxes of books and um, it's taken Amazon like a little over a month to open them. What does it just take time for them to un unbox them and get them into your inventory? Is that a problem people are having or is it just specific warehouses? I mean, what is there something going on? That is a great question. Um, I, I heard this question from other people. Um, we also sometimes get this issue. This would depend on the warehouse and depend on the workload they have. And also there might be some shipment problems and they're gonna have to sideline your items. Also, uh, they can receive your items and some of them are gonna be uh, fulfillment center transfer. This is something internal, like Amazon internal thing that we don't know what algorithm they use, but some of them, they become available uh, as, as soon as they receive in the first destination. And on some of them, they got fulfillment center transfer. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. For your awesome. Sue, if you want to go. Hey. My question is about um, the scanning software, the sc uh, scouting software. So mm -hmm. I'm currently using um, the Scout IQ, but if Caleb Roth has basically retired, then is that going to be updated? And Amazon keeps making changes, so I don't want to be buying books that really aren't profitable. Um, is Booksy very similar, or how? You know, how would what's the learning curve? Thank you for your question. Um, so in some features, we try to be make it similar to get the uh, user habits, not to have something new, but uh, for the features that we thought super cool that the other apps do not have, this is gonna be something new. But for the getting the information side, uh, we have a great, we have a full development team. We are working, uh, working every day on it, uh, updating it. And for the Scout IQ, I know another company re acquired that. And that company is more broader company. They, uh, my, uh, according to my um, thought, it's going to be more broad scanning application because they, I, I checked the companies, the products they have. I think they're going to make, make it more broader application. When you have something really specific in the some specific business niche, you will have more accuracy, more uh, be better features. So our accuracy rate and 
our features are great. We are currently using a uh, books pro booksy application in our operation. We also have the cherry picking operation that we still continue. I'm going to have Brenda ask a question and then we'll get Johnny Flip's question who is our next speaker. So it'd be a good segue. And then um, that'll be it for this. And we'll move on to Johnny Flips, who has been traveling the country, finding books. He's out there in the field. Um, Johnny will share what his sales were. I texted him, but he didn't text me back. But I think he's cracked five figures per month. Maybe, maybe not. Five figures, Johnny? Yes, no? He's, he's unmuting himself right now. I got to have my proper introduction of Johnny. If he can never figure out how to unmute himself. Uh, Brenda, let's get Brenda first, and then Johnny, you'll come up next. You got to unmute yourself, girl. <laughs> unmute. Unmute. Yeah. There we are. <laughs> I wasn't holding my tongue right. <laughs> Omar, nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. Uh, my question is is about the big pellet you get of books. What does that cost um, for that? And is that shipping included in that cost? Um, sure. So that cost would that cost would depend on the quantity that you are buying. If you are getting a couple of gaylords at a time, it would be a lot higher freight cost per gaylord because if it's local, it's going to be uh, very close to full truck load freight. Um, but if you are getting full truck load, this is going to be cheaper on the freight cost. And also, there are some things that you might do to reduce this cost. For example, we are swapping pallets and gaylords uh, with our local source. Even if it's like we have some source in California, that we do round trip and we swap the Gaylords because they are selling like 30, 35 dollars per uh, Gaylord pallet set. So we are booking the freight round trip to save some uh, save some money on this uh, pallet and Gaylord cost. For the books, it may uh, vary on the quality. So if you are getting salvage material from Goodwill. Like we, we have some source that we are paying only one cent per pound. It's like super cheap. And uh, we have some sor source uh, we are paying like two cents, three, four cents a pound. But there are some that may be like 10 cents, even 12, 13 cents per pound without the PG set and the freight. But those, uh, if those are like straight donations coming from the donation bins. If uh, people did not go through scan those, you may find like very profitable books from them. So it, it would also matter the quality, not just the cost. You need to ask questions to your source uh, about the quality. You may ask some pictures from the uh, actual items that you are buying also uh how the the way that collect these items are these coming from one individual donators or is that coming from multiple in multiple uh locations or is, is this a straight donation bin you can ask some questions to figure out the quality of the source and then you can put a budget on it you can say if this is uh pure donations i can pay up to 10 cents 12 cents per pound okay Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Awesome. All right, Johnny, if you want to go ahead and ask your question, and then I'll introduce you to everyone. I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Do you see that notification to unmute yourself? Boom, there we go. Yes, sir. What's going on? So uh, I was curious if, uh, do you have anything that you do with the uh, non-barcode uh, or pre-ISBN books by any chance? Non barcode, non ISBN. This this was my struggle, and this stayed uh, as a struggle for a long time in my current business, because this would require a lot more knowledge. Uh, we, uh, I tried to hire a virtual assistant from out of country and made 
our warehouse associate take pictures of the copyright page and uh, our virtual assistant made the research so that I can pay less money for that. And I also tried to uh, do consignment with other people that are doing really well. For example, um, common, common ground products. Common ground finds, yeah. Max Rubeck, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. I don't know how he knows the value of the books by its cover. He's very talented and very experienced. Uh, you can talk to him. Uh, we worked with him. He's very convenient. I like him a lot. Uh, the thing that we stopped working with him, the reason was uh, the freight cost. We are too far from each other. If he was closer, I would definitely work with him again. Um, and also, I also tried to partner up with uh, a local bookstore in Phoenix area. None of them uh, worked out for me. So when yeah. I have time, uh, I try to go through, I put, put the titles uh, the author name on eBay. eBay is the best place to go. And also there is vialibri.net. I don't know if you heard that. vialibri.net, I can put it in the comment uh, chat. Uh, on this website, if you put the title, the author name, the publication dates, it's going to show you the uh, approximate value. And I wouldn't list if there is no sold history on eBay. And also, I heard that Amazon is very good for those items as well, but uh, I haven't tried it yet. Awesome. Sweet. Guys, give it up for Omer. If you enjoyed that, drop some love in the chat. Drop a one if, if you enjoyed that. We'll see those ones flood in. Nancy, Heather, Kimberly, Phyllis. All right, brother, really appreciate you. And we should definitely yeah. do some stuff in the future because this just flew by. Um, and we're six minutes over already. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, thank you, man. Up thank next, you, yeah, yeah. Up next, we have Johnny Flips, who has been traveling the country, uh, sourcing books, just like I started back in the day. I lived in my car traveling around. So it kind of reminds me of what, of what I was doing. So this guy is in the field. He knows where to get books. Uh, he's put together a PowerPoint, so big shout out to him. Uh, I believe this might be his first time giving an entrepreneur public presentation. So um, super excited to have Johnny Flips. Guys, give it up for Johnny. If you can unmute yourself, brother. <laughs> why are you having trouble? There I don't know go. why I keep getting muted. Sorry about that. What's going on? Uh... Hello from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, let's see, uh, how, how do I get the screen share up here? One second, let me uh, give you permission. Boom, you're good to go. All right, can you see my screen? Not yet. Did you click on share screen? Sorry, as you can tell, I'm a newbie at this here. At the bottom, it should be the green button hover at the bottom. It might have to appear. Oh, yep. See you now. All right. We're good to go. Uh, let's see. Sure. I believe in you. <laughs> Sorry, it's asking me to. It's like, oh, update that? system preferences. Hmm. Should I just be able to click on share screen at the bottom. It's not having you download anything, is it? Um, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's saying Zoom US may not be able to record the content to your screen on, uh, on television. Right. Just see if you can do it. Just see if, if it allows you to share. Yeah, it's a, it wants me to quit and reopen. So um, OK, we, we could. Uh, let's see if um, the next speaker. Actually, I could go. I'll go. You figure this out. You download it. Um, we're currently at 293 people. So uh, my team, Dez and Rustam, don't let 300 people in. Make sure Johnny can get back in. <laughs> um, so we don't. For sure. Sorry about that. So prioritize Johnny coming back in. Don't let 300 people come in. Always keep it at 299. All right. I will go ahead and go then. Um, so. Oh wait, I think I got it. Oh. Did I get it? Yeah, yeah. You're there. All right, for sure. Sorry about that, guys. You're like, man, this guy's an amateur. <laughs> All righty. So, yeah, 
Let's get into these uh, road trip profits. I'm currently in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, my name is Johnny Flips. I'm John. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And uh, I left home back in November to uh, source these books on the road, snowbird to Florida, get to somewhere warmer, uh, spend some time with family in Florida. I uh, started selling on Amazon in uh, 2022 of June, and I sold uh, just over $60,000 in used books, uh, not including eBay. I've done a little bit on eBay, too, with uh, Max Ruback which uh, Omer was talking about a little bit, Common Ground Finds. I'll, uh, I'll get in a little bit more later to uh, how to get in contact with Max if you're interested in uh, looking into the pre-ISBN books. But yeah. So why books? As we most know, most of us know, uh, if not all of us here, books are extremely low cost. You know, on average, they're one to $2 each. They're at books are everywhere. You know, there, there's never going to be a shortage of books. It's they're basically infinite. And, you know, they, the, the ROI on books is there's not a single product out there where you could have a larger return on your investment. Maybe, you know, all media in general, whether it's CDs, DVDs, books, video games, you know, you're not going to get a larger return on your investment. And another great thing about books is a majority of people view them as a nuisance. So say you want to do a free book pickup, you know, a lot of the times you should be able to get the books for free. You shouldn't be, you know, if you you're, make a contact with, say, an estate sale and they're trying to get you to pay for the books, you should do everything in your power to get those books for free because it's backbreaking work. A lot of the times you know, you might strike out on a deal and not get good books with, say, a, you know, a free book pickup. So, well, most people view them as a nuisance. So you should be getting these for free. So my, I find my inventory everywhere and anywhere. I'll find them in my hometown, your hometown, their hometown. You know, I'm not scared to travel for books. Even when I'm at home in Detroit, sometimes I'll drive as far as three hours to a library sale, you know. Um, heck, even if, uh, say there's two sales in a day, a library sale, um, maybe one of them's really big. Another one's not so big, you know, consider going to the one that's smaller because the competition is going to be fierce at that, you know, giant book sale. Cause everybody's like, Oh, 50,000 books. Let's, I gotta be there. That's where all the good books are. You know, it's herd mentality. They see a bunch of people at one book sale. They want to go to that. They continue to go there. So, you know, maybe go to that other book sale. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, again, it's not really a secret whether you're doing bulk, cherry picking. I'm getting my inventory from the same places as all you guys. I'm going to libraries, bookstores. A lot of you aren't going to bookstores. Well, so, the reason I love bookstores is because people... You know, a big reason we tend to avoid bookstores is, oh, they're too expensive. They know what they got or so. And the thing is, a lot of these bookstores, they're not selling on Amazon. They might be some no disrespect or anything, but might be an old timer that doesn't want to, you know, isn't very knowledgeable in the Internet or so. You know, they just don't want to deal with the hassle. So just actually yesterday, I just finished up at a bookstore and over three days, I probably sourced. $3,000 in potential profit at this bookstore. It was pretty insane. And, you know, I was, I wasn't trying to be secret about it. Wasn't like hiding in the corner scanning, you know, you know, I went directly up to her, told her about what I did and uh, she was completely fine with it. She's like, please scan away. She was ec ecstatic how many books I was buying, you know, it's like, Oh my God, you're my best customer ever. And, you know, working out deals with her made a relationship. She gave me a little bit of a discount and yeah, so don't be scared of those bookstores. And, you know, it was like 3 to $4 a book. Maybe some of them were $5 a book, which some of us view that as expensive. Some of us, you know, that's our, you know, just standard going rate. But for me, that's a little expensive. But like I said, go. others are willing to go there and pay those prices. So you should be. Again, thrift stores, almost, I'm sure every single person here has been to a thrift store. Romer has probably the number one preacher for getting that backroom access. This applies to libraries as well. You know, I don't care 
how many times you get turned down. I probably get turned down backroom access 10 times for every one that I get the backroom access. Many times I get that backroom access and they scare me out of there. This happened just a week ago. I got that backroom access, I was scanning. And before you know it, they got I got the rug pulled from underneath me and they're like, another friends of the library showed up like, like what's he doing back here, blah, blah, blah. And long story short, didn't work out, but be persistent. Don't, you know, ask for that backroom access. If you go there consistently, maybe bring them donuts, coffee, you know, and incentivize them be, and just be nice, be genuine, be nice, not much to it. Flea markets are another uh, really good, I think, overlooked source. Um, I did really well at I'm not, I don't live there, so I'll let this uh, information out, but uh, the Ocala Flea Market in uh, Florida, there's a book lady there, and I did extremely well there. I mean, I, I've been, I went there twice, and both times it was a $1,000 profit day I, I left there with. All really good books, too. Consignment shops, that's probably my least favorite. You know, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a hit or miss, but it's mostly going to be a, be a miss for the most part. Or free book pickups. I, I kind of have an order of best to worst if you're on the road sourcing, because obviously a free book pickup, that's going to be a little bit more difficult to do on the road. You, you know, you're going to have these duds to get rid of. You might already have accepts in the trunk, but free book pick. And you're not doing pickups posting on next. Um, um, I just froze. Yeah, yeah, you're back though. I don't know what happened. Maybe it's my sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm running off a hot spot right now. But I was saying, yeah, free book pickups. You need to be doing this, whether you're posting on a uh, next door Facebook Marketplace. Those those are where your biggest scores are going to be guaranteed. If you're not traveling, free book pickups are a must do. Also, some tips for sourcing on the road would be, again, a lot of the stuff I've learned from is from Romer. I should almost be calling him my mentor at this point, but uh, map out your stops beforehand, at least the day before, but I usually do it the night before. And what I like to do is I have an end goal in mind. Like right now I'm in Savannah, Georgia. And what I'm thinking of is, all right, my next stop's gonna be Charleston. So I map out you know, the route to Charleston, I put it side to side on Google Maps and Google, and um, I search up libraries near me, and then I'll stop at each library along the route. Call them beforehand too, make sure they actually have the books. But I'll do a little test stop at that library. I'll see how I do, and you know, if you do really well at a source at a library, then you could tell a lot about a town by the books in their library. You know. You Say you're in West Virginia, you might find a lot of books about, I don't know, coal mining or whatever it is. But, you know, if you do well at a library in a town, it's probably indicative that you are going to do well at the thrift stores in that town as well. Now, I'm not 100% believer in this, but I do do it a little bit. I'm mostly in the big cities, I'm worried about this, but you should be sourcing in the wealthier areas of your town. Again, Romer provided me with this. This little tidbit here for citydata.com. So what you're going to want to do is look at that and you're going to want to focus on the areas that are highlighted in purple. Those are going to be the wealthier areas. Like I said, I'm not a huge, it, it definitely does can make a difference. The thing is these thrift stores and maybe not libraries, but the thrift stores for sure they might be getting their books from a different area. They're not necessarily getting donations from that direct area. At home in Detroit, like I go to a not so nice part of town at this one thrift store and I find that's the best thrift store in the entire area. And it's in the worst area of the town. It's kind of amazing. So I would really wonder where, I, where they're getting their books, but uh, they don't really wanna share that information with me. I've tried to get that back from access many times. And do what others won't, you know? I'm a huge believer in doing the type-ins, the manual type-ins, or using the Amazon facial recognition, you know, on the Amazon seller app. I think that's a, I'd say 30 to 40% of my inventory at this point has to be manual type-ins or 
books that I found with the Amazon seller app. And there's you want to like explain money. what you mean by the uh, fa uh, facial recognition? What do you mean by that? Yeah, sure. For so, people that so don't maybe know. Maybe I could pull up my phone right here. Um, so what you would do is you open up the Amazon seller app and on the top right, right there, let me see, the top right, right there, you'd click on the camera and like, let's see, like, you just try and get it to recognize something, you know, and it just pulls up a listing. That was a cup. So he, he's not doing it with, a, with like a Sonic cup right now, but you can literally yeah. do it with anything. Like the cover yeah, of the book is great if it's got like unique artwork and it's not just like a book that has only read on the cover. For most books, it works and it's it's great. It's amazingly accurate, honestly. It's, I, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's, there's big money in those pre ISBN books or, uh, you know, and I call them type ins, the ISBN type ins, but really, you know, on Scout IQ, you could switch to uh, like, there's obviously you could scan with your phone or there's the middle setting that says ISBN and you click on that and you only, you have to open the book up to the library. Uh, I think it's called the library congressional information page and you just hover it above the ISBN and it would scan it as if it were a barcode, pulls up the book, bling, oh, that's a good book. <laughs> so yeah, uh, do, the, do that extra work that others won't do. I'm a huge believer in that. And stick with what works. If you're on the road- You wanna share your screen again? I, I took your screen oh, off. You oh, sorry. I no, you're good. Yeah, just do the same thing. Uh, go to the bottom and click on the share. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So yeah, uh, stick with what works. If this applies to a library sale, if you're sourcing on the road, you know, we again we have this herd mentality, almost an animalistic mentality of you know you're at a library sale, it's like Black Friday, people are going crazy. You know, the first hour or two, everybody walks out assuming that there's no good books anymore. And it's just simply not true. If you want to put in that extra work, go back through, do the manual type-ins, use that Amazon seller facial recognition, and you are going to walk up. If you did well scanning the books, you'll probably do even better with the type-ins and the facial recognition because the acceptance rate is probably double, <clears throat> excuse me, double uh, for the manual type-ins. So don't be lazy. Do, do what others won't do and stick with what works. So uh, some mistakes to learn from, uh, know when to move on. I tend, I'm sure we're all, uh, all of us cherry pickers are guilty of this to some extent. You know, if you're in the religion section and you just scan two to 300 books and you didn't get one except, even if you're doing type-ins too, you probably need to be leaving there. Avoiding expensive sources. Like I said, with the bookstore philosophy, you know, a lot of people aren't willing to pay four to five dollars a book. And, and you, that's where you're going to find good books. The acceptance rate might be astronomically higher than the other sources in your area because people don't want to pay those extra couple dollars. I'm not scared to pay 10, 20 dollars anymore for a book. You know, remember I was at a thrift store or at a bookstore called McKay's in Tennessee, and I was like, Asking uh, Romer, like, oh, would you buy this book? It's a $40 profit, but it costs 20. He's like, I'd buy that all day. Are you kidding me? I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, so don't be sca scared of uh, spending uh, extra money on a book. If you're getting higher quality inventory, like you should be willing to pay up. Avoiding the pre-ISBN books. If you're doing bulk, maybe this isn't such a viable solution, like, or, you know, option, like Omer was saying. But uh, over here, here's some uh, example of sales. I actually use, uh, you mentioned Max Ruback of Common Ground Finds, and I currently consign with him. And like he said, that dude is like a walking thesaurus. It's amazing. You know, you just, you go on FaceTime with him, sh you show him the shelves. You could even just take pictures of books. He'll give you a thumbs up, thumbs down. Or if he gets really excited, he gives you a call. He goes, take that book and put it in that bag right now. Uh, but just just the last week, I found a five hundred dollar book sitting on a bookshelf. It's called a Cocktail Time. I think it's called Cocktail Time in Cuba, something like that. It was sitting there broad daylight, you know. And it was a place I know scanners have been. It's amazing. People were just hopping over 
hundreds, if not thousand dollar books. So, I mean, you could see at the bottom here, I sold a book for 700, actually that it was like $700 that I ended up selling it for the Robert Frank first edition. So those are all examples of a uh, pre ISBN books found with the help of Max Rubeck. Another mistake is matching buy box initially, you know, we sh you should not be, especially if an item has a high sales velocity, why would you want to match the buy box? And on top of that, do not, you should not be lowering by a penny, at least for the first two months. Maybe I, if you want to after the second month, it's whatever. But I personally don't lower by a penny or any amount whatsoever, I think until month five. Maybe I should be more aggressive with that now since uh, storage fees have gone up so much. But uh, Go to lister is shameless, not shameless plug, but shout out to Romer because that's honestly was a huge pain point for me. And that's got to be the best automated solution out there for, you know, pricing higher, you know, while at still having a speedy workflow. Sending in junk, you know, I sent in a lot of bad books in the beginning. You know, it, it might not matter as much if you're doing bulk. But, you know, say, oh, we'll make it up in numbers or so. But if you, you know, you should, even if you're 100% FBA, I personally believe you should still be looking at the merchant fulfilled offers and seeing, okay, is there 120 other used offers on this listing? If, you know, if there, if there is, you know, it's a lot more likely that the price of that book is going to tank in value. And you should look also, say, the used buy box, it'll accept green. Oh, you're making $30 profit. Well, yeah, but there's the hundred merchant fulfilled offers at five and six dollars. Unless it's a textbook, you are extremely unlikely to get to actually make that sale. Don't get me wrong, it happens, but you are extremely likely to, if not lose money on that book, you know, it just it's going to tank in value. And in the, uh, the last mistake I probably still make to this date is a uh, over consuming content. If you haven't started yet, or maybe, you know, you're, you just started, you kind of have a good idea of things. Sometimes it's best to put down the phone, close the computer, get out there and source, actually learn stuff in the field. You know, I spent, I, I said, I'd say I was watching YouTube videos six hours a day. It was unreal. Like I, <laughs> I was watching videos more than I was sourcing. Like, just get out yeah, there and go. Pro, pro, pro tip is put the headphones on like I have. I'm a huge fan of headphones. And if you do want to listen to like a podcast, I'm going to try to post this on YouTube afterwards, this whole Book Sound Boot Camp, if Zoom cooperates. If you guys want to like re-listen to it or, you know, if you're listening to it for the first time, put your headphones on as you're scanning, have your audio cues. So like that's honestly, I don't think I would have sold books if I couldn't have consumed content at the same time because i could basically read a book a day literal a literal book a day just going in thrift stores scanning and listening to audiobooks so that's my pro tip for sure yeah absolutely yeah use that drive time while you're scanning you know consume your content then but uh like i said don't over consume that content get that get out there and do it all right, some uh, final bonus tips here. One that I think is, this is like very good tip right here. Use wholesale audio cues. So what these are is if you set your buy cost at $2, say sell back your book is gonna offer you $2.10. Well, you're gonna hear a little scratchy noise trigger when you know sell back your book is offering more than your buy cost. And that might be a good indication that you should be picking up that book. Say there's no, you know, Scout IQ is smart, but it's not intelligent, I guess you could say. So say there's no used offers, there's only new offers, Amazon isn't on the listing, you're gonna scan a book, it'll go do, you know, it's gonna think to reject the book. But it might be a hundred dollar book, it doesn't know because there's no used offer to compare it to. But if you have this wholesale audio cue on, and you could see sell back your book wants to pay you $4 for it. That then, you know, you look at the book and you say, all right, let's look at the keep a chart. Let's see what it sold for used in the past. Holy crap, this sells for $100 frequently in the past. And I'm the only used offer. You're going to send that book in and it's going to fly off the shelf. I sell books all the time where there's zero offers. Maybe there might not even be a new offer, but 
if sell back your book is off, you know, a really good example, I wish I uh, put in a picture of it. Um, uh, I got a, a rare French cookbook and sell back your book, I think wanted to give me 50 cents for it. But I looked at Keepa and I saw it was a 300 plus dollar book. And I sold that book for $350 because of this whole wholesale audio cue feature. Another thing is don't overlook the high rank books. You know, even I'm not even scared of books with zero e-score. Like Omar said, he sells books that are six to seven million rank daily. You know, you might scan a book, say it's six million rank, zero e-score, but there's only one offer at a thousand dollars. Okay, you you might be excited, like, oh my God, I'm gonna get rich. Well, you won't check the keepa, see, all right, what is this book sold for in the past? You might look and see, oh yeah, this book is sold all the time in the past for say $8. Or you could look and see, all right, this book has sold a lot in the past in the $300 range and the market's just not willing to buy this guy's $1,000 copy. Well, so if it is a $300 book, pick it up, send it in or merchant fulfill it, whatever you want to do. And, uh, you know, get put that fair market value on it. And a lot of the times you'll get the sale, if not rather quickly especially if you could see um, community tracking on Keepa, just kind of a, another advanced tip. I don't want to get too off track because I know we're on a time schedule here. Um, Common Ground Finds, you know, that's Max Ruback. You utilize him if you don't want to manually look into these pre-ISBN and antiquarian books on your own. You know, you could just find him on Instagram or reach out to me and I'll help you connect with him. But a uh, super cool guy. He's awesome. Splits, splits the profits 50-50 with you. He's a genius. <laughs> but another good tip is Barnes & Noble free boxes. I love these boxes. They hold just about 50 pounds. You know, it, they're, it's perfect. You get 50 pounds in there. The boxes are durable. They're free. The employees are more than happy to share them with you, too. You know, I've never gotten turned down for, you know, boxes from Barnes & Noble. Another the write-offs for this trip, basically everything I'm doing is a write-off. No matter like the mileage is the deduction for my mileage alone is huge. I mean, we're talking 55 cents a mile. Keep in mind, I drove from Detroit to all the way to Key West and then all over too. Like just it's it's gonna be ridiculous. You could write off the hotels, you could write off, you could probably write off the clothes that you buy on the trip. You could write off your meals, you know, it's it's pretty amazing what you can. And hotels combined, it's a little tidbit if you want to do sourcing on the road. It's just a really cool um, application that uh, it just it has a really good uh, like search engine and you could uh, filter like, oh, I want free breakfast. I want this, that. And it compares all the prices across uh, like all the, you know, big uh, hotel booking companies. And yeah, remember to enjoy yourself too on vacation. Not too much though, because... Uh, I find myself giving down, I'm either 100% work or uh, like 100% leisure at a point. So when you're like, I'm in Savannah, Georgia right now, they're really known for uh, for St. Patrick's Day. So I'm gonna stay here tomorrow, party it up a little bit. And then the next day hit the road and get back to those books. Well, if you guys have any questions and if you'd like to follow my journey, I would greatly appreciate it. As you can tell, I'm a newbie at a, presenting, uh, talking, and making my social media content. Thank you for bearing with me. And yeah, if you want to get into some questions, I'd be gladly to answer. Yeah, let's uh, start with your hands up, guys. We got time for a few questions. We're running a little bit over, but we started John late. So, all right, we'll start with Renair. Hope I'm saying that correctly. What's yeah. up? What's going on? You guys see me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Buddy, so uh, I have one question. So I did plan a trip to Vegas. And so I'm pretty sure I'm just going to go out there and source because I mean, mm. a 19 year old kid going to Vegas, you can't do anything as a 19 year old in Vegas. So I'm just going right. out strictly, uh, to strictly source. I am staying in someone else's house. Do you have any heads up kind of tips for me when you go out of state and source? Is there kind of like a game plan you got? Did you did you say you're flying or driving? I'm flying, but I have a uh, I have family over there that would lend me a car. I already talked it with them, so I I will be driving. 
Yeah, I mean, I would just say, like I said, um, map out your trip using uh, whether it's Apple Maps, Apple Maps, Google Maps, look, use citydata.com. Maybe start with the wealthier areas with the, you know, the highlight citydata.com. You could, uh, it'll basically the purple spots will be the wealthiest areas. And you're going to want to go to those libraries, those thrift stores. And if you're not finding good stuff at those libraries and thrift stores, then you're going to have to get really creative with your sourcing. You know, it's, it, it might not, you might not be able, there are some cities that are just over and saturated for the low hanging fruit. So, you know, you might have to do free book pickups or go to these expensive bookstores. Um, I'm not, I have been to Vegas, actually. The one time I've been to Vegas was for a, a book selling conference, this uh, Scout IQ summit that just happened. But um, yeah, I mean, having a car is extremely nice. Try and get, try and um, plan like where you're stopping based upon like rush hour, like because you don't want to be driving at peak you know, drive home times or so you should be in a store sourcing, like say three to 5 PM or so, you know? Um, but yeah, just uh, map, map out your sort. Oh, wait, something just happened. I just changed it so they could see your beautiful face. Oh, for sure. So yeah, I got, I map, got, your, map socials out. Dropped. I got your socials dropped in the chat. Everyone go follow them on YouTube and IG. I left everything. I left, I did everything except for TikTok. I don't have your TikTok link. So if you guys want to for follow sure. Johnny in the group chat, in the chat below, you guys can uh, click on those links. I appreciate it. Yeah, we got you above 200 followers, man. So I don't know what you're at right now, but I checked a second ago. And so if you guys haven't followed him on IG. Dang. Yeah, I got a ton of videos I got to edit. I'm still learning how to edit videos and stuff, but... Uh... Yeah, Everyone go like, comment, go comment on his last YouTube video. Do you even have a YouTube video up? Yeah, I think I have two. It's embarrassing. Go comment, but, encourage but, him to post. Enc uh, go comment. We want more on his <laughs> last YouTube video. Let's get this man to post more. Yeah, I got to do it. It's, uh, it's fun. It's easy to get caught up in the sourcing. And, uh, you know, you get busy with the sourcing and you, you're like, oh, I don't want to ship out these books or oh, I got to post content now, too. It's a it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, oh, I got to create this PowerPoint. Oh, I literally yeah. created this. I probably shouldn't even say this, but I created this PowerPoint probably two or three hours ago. Yeah, <laughs> like, dude, it's, it's what we all do. It, it, you yeah. get your best. Home, you, you finish your homework the fastest, with, you know, 10 minutes before class. So for sure. Um, yeah, we got time for one more question. And then we'll uh, move on. What's up, Damien? Am I saying your name right? Yeah, it's Damien. It just Damien. looks. It, like, well, I recognize it, it, that's you how from you say Vegas. It. That's how yeah. you say it in Spanish. Yeah. But I've been yep. saying words weird. I, I'm, I'm instead of Israel, I'm saying Israel. Yeah. Because that's how you say it in Spanish, and your name is Damien. That's how you would pronounce it in Spanish. <laughs> in Espanol, e is a. Yeah. In Espanol, Damian. Um, there's a technically an accent on the well. The e. way it's spelled would be Damian. Damian. Well, so technically, like my birth certificate, I've got an accent on the e. So think like Beyonce, hmm. where okay. you've got an gotcha. a accent of e. All right. Okay. Sorry though. Sorry to get off yep. topic. <laughs> um, Johnny, I, I I'm curious. It. What all you take with you on the road? Like what tools you take versus maybe what you would leave behind at home? How your For process sure. is different sourcing on the road versus like out of your garage at home? yeah it can definitely be a lot you know going in and out of these hotels especially when I'm switching hotel day after day but uh yeah so you know I bring all the general stuff with me I got my Scotty peelers this is a set stickers poly bags goo gone um thermal printer my laptop chargers a scale um packing material I get my boxes from Barnes and Noble so uh a heat gun and yeah I like to uh I fold up the boxes um get them ready in the car you know fill up the boxes as I go and like once I fill up all the boxes I have in my trunk you know just put them on the little hotel cart bring them into the hotel list them out from the hotel get the shipment out and yes sir it's a lot of work but Maybe a thought for a video. I'd love to see how you organize that and, you know, get it all condensed down for, for travel days. 
Yeah, I yeah. kind of have some content that I need to actually compile together, but it, it's kind of a mess. Sometimes I forget to record and I'm, I'm still new to it. But Yeah, I, to I would watch. I, I wish somebody told me this back in the day starting YouTube. I would watch Mr. Beast videos on his uh, opinion towards good YouTube videos. Go watch his videos on how to make a good YouTube video and just like listen to like hours of him. And you'll just instantly like through osmo osmosis get better ideas. I documented my journey terribly when I started out. Like if you watch my video where I'm living in my car, it's like such a shitty video. It's like, why would I not show more of like the inside of my car? Like hey. I'm just like looking at the camera and I'm like in the desert and I'm like not even showing like the cool part of the video. So uh, Mr. Beast is a huge recommendation for you. For sure. But appreciate you, man. Uh, thanks for coming on. Everyone give, give Johnny some love. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. It's weird not being live. Every time I say that, I expect people to clap and then like, I can't hear anything. <laughs> so, right. No, they hated me. <laughs> <laughs> Give some love in the, in the comments, guys. Drop, <laughs> drop a one. It's an easy thing to do. Drop a one if, if you enjoyed Johnny's talk. Appreciate it. hundred percent. All right. Next up, we have me, I believe. I don't want to skip anybody. Let me double check schedule. Yep. I'm up next. And then after that, we got Rake and Profit. You know, we got Joji. So I'll actually, I'll cut mine a little bit short. We'll do 20 minutes for me. I don't think it should take me too long to present anyway. And I do want to, I want to dive more into Q and A with you guys, because I'm going to email all of you my exact repricing strategy. And the way I present this, if you guys use reprice it, if you guys use be cool or other softwares, I'm going to mention a software that I've used that has been tremendously helpful for me, but it, Take away the concept that I talk about more than my actual repricing template, which you guys will get my exact template. There are some weird things you have to do to make this work manually, but um, yeah, let's dive into this. Okay. All right. So the software that I recommend you use for, for repricing, what's worked for me at least is called channel max. Okay. Now, this was recommended to me uh, at my conference in Miami. I do a conference every year where we get the biggest Amazon sellers together. And I think one of the biggest, the biggest Amazon seller I know is Glenn, the bookseller. I met him in Vegas and he does like, I don't know, 80 million, 100 million plus a year. So the biggest Amazon seller I know is a bookseller. But the, the second biggest Amazon seller I know is Scott Needham. He does wholesale. And his whole talk in Miami was about pricing up. You should price up as often as possible. If you want to make more profit in your business, you should sell your stuff for more. So this strategy takes that into play. And before we talk about repricing, let's talk about initially pricing. So when I was traveling in Tennessee with my mentor, Caleb Roth, the book flipper, again, who's retired, <laughs> From, from this business, he I watched him and his wife at the time list books. And what they were doing was they would open up Scout IQ, they would scan the book, and who here, drop a two in the chat, if you've ever scanned a book on Scout IQ and it says $8 profit and you go to list it and it says $2 profit, who here has ever experienced that? Drop a two in the chat if so. It's, it's infuriating and starting out when you don't understand this stuff, you're like, one of these apps is lying to me. And then, then somebody will go download another app. Maybe it's Booksy, maybe it's Scoutly, maybe it's, I don't know, some other book selling software. And then everybody always prefers the software that tells them it's the most profit, whether or not that's correct. You got to realize all these softwares are just pulling prices from Amazon and different things happen. But in order to minimize that experience where you're in the thrift store and you scan a book and it tells you $17 profit and you go home and it tells you five, and, or, and maybe you paid $5 for it. It's really frustrating. In order to avoid that, what Caleb's wife would do is she would scan every book with Scout IQ, and then she would list the book on the listing software. At the time, it was Acceler list she was using. And then she would type in the price that Scout IQ recommended. And I was like, this is so strange. Like, even as a young I call myself a kid back then. I think I was 23, 24 years old. I was like, why don't they use a software solution to fix this? And also I know Caleb's like extremely intelligent. 
And so I'm, I'm also like, why is Caleb initially pricing books in the first place? Like if he could just have his repricer handle it. And the reason is you only get one chance to initially price a book and all repricers are blind to FBA offers. So for example, if we open up, well, actually we should probably open up a book with no FBA offers. So if you open up uh, any listing for a book, there's, this is a book without FBA offers. So this is an opportunity where you could price higher. Drop a drop Prime in the chat if you're a Prime member. If you have Amazon Prime, if you get you know one two day shipping delivered to your house, drop Prime. Let's let me just give a quick shout out. This is always insane when I do this. We got Nancy, Winston, Leslie, Lee. We got all these Prime members in the house. So, are you guys? It, it, this book's currently twenty two dollars, and it arrives April first to April fourth. That is insanely slow. Who here would pay? $25 to get this tomorrow. What if this is a textbook and you had a test on Monday? Would you pay $30 for it? Drop a yes in the chat if you would pay a little bit extra just to get the book delivered the next day. Drop a yes in the chat if so. I see John saying yes, Brenda, Lee, everyone saying yes. And so my point is people pay more for Prime books. So this is a book that most softwares would price at 22, but uh, you can price this higher. This is a big opportunity to price higher. And here's another book. Uh, this should have, let's see, this has a used buy box. So this is truly, well, this looks more, it's still kind of a slow delivery. Um, this might be an opportunity to price higher as well. So my point is people pay more for Prime, so you should price higher. And so at GoToLister, what we've done is we've, come up with these pricing rules. So these are pretty similar to Scout IQ, but they're not exact. And so it's important to initially price your book because again, you only get one chance. And like, there's a lot of manual um, pricing still, but our software will, I'll show you what our software will automatically do. So if it's an insanely fast selling book under 100, 125,000 sales rank, go to lister is gonna price it at FBA slot four. And so this is the first part of my, repricing uh, formula. I guess this is initially pricing, but this existed before GoToLister existed. So this isn't just a GoToLister plug. Again, Caleb and his wife, they were doing this as they were listing books. We did a book deal at a college or yeah, college closed down in Tennessee and every book she listed, she would scan with Scott IQ first. She would see the Scott IQ recommended price. And so when I made my listing software, I made it so it automatically did that for you. And it's not perfect, just like none of these apps are perfect. Amazon's Amazon wants customers to be happy. Amazon never wants to overcharge customers. They've gotten in, they've gotten in trouble with the Supreme Court that they're price gouging during COVID. They were selling Germex, or we were selling Germex. Uh, sellers were selling masks for like 10x what the price was, and so. Amazon got, Amazon got in trouble for that. And because of that, Amazon basically limits what softwares can see. So what we've done is we try our best to automatically price higher for you. And if we can't price higher for you, what we do is we notify you. We have different notifications that tell you, hey, this is a book that has some weird data being returned by Amazon. We don't think that there's any FBA offers for this book. And so it'll come up with no FBA offers. It'll come up with this purple text right here. So um, that's one feature that I really like about this. And anyway, that's the initial part of my pricing process. So we initially price the book at a very optimistic price and we leave it at that price for 30 days. We don't, we don't touch it for 30 days. And again, I'll send a replay of, my exact repricing strategy to all you guys, but here's my repricing strategy in a nutshell. So what we do is we match the buy box. So after 30 days, we let that price sit that go to list or set. And then for 30 days, we don't touch it. After that, we compete for buy box. Okay, so we're, we're targeting buy box, which is almost always held by the lowest prime offer. The lowest FBA offer usually wins the buy box. So we are competing for the buy box. Okay. Now you're probably asking, well, what if there's no prime offers? 
you know, isn't your repricer just going too low? Well, yeah, it is. But to combat that, what we've done is I've implemented a strategy that Scott Needham talked about at Miami Sellers Conference. And every night we have time variant pricing where we price up for two hours from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. We reprice to our maximum price. It honestly doesn't really matter what your maximum price is. I recommend your maximum price be semi-realistic. For example, if you have a book that has a $30 buy box price, I recommend setting your maximum price maybe at 45 bucks, you know, maybe at one and a half times whatever the price is. That's pretty good. So if you have a hundred dollar book, your maximum price is going to be $150. And so what our software will do, and again, all you guys are going to email how to set minimum, maximum prices, all that stuff. I, I'm giving you all my SOPs too, how my team does it. It's a little bit tedious, but you can just do it once a week and you'll, you'll be okay. Um, I'm actually talking with Channel Max about potentially integrating with GoToLister. So you guys, this will automatically be done for you. But every night we reprice up and I'll give one scenario about how this could be really helpful. Uh, so think about, I'll give one scenario where this would actually make you more money. So if there's no prime offers on a listing and it's currently priced at $13, your repricer, the, it, most settings, whether you're using Be Cool, any of these guys, in this case, Channel Max, we, our first default formula is to attack buy box price. So it's going to go down to $13, right? Because $13 is a buy box. Now, there's no FBA offers, there's no prime competition. So at nighttime, you're going to price one and a half times higher. What's going to happen? What's half of 13? seven, 6.5, it's going to be priced at 19 and a half dollars. My math is correct. If Amazon will oftentimes give buy box, I've buy box at $200 when the lowest price was a hundred. I've buy box at $2,000 on a, a vintage Jewish set of books when the lowest price was 13. In the book world, it's different than all other categories. I sell other categories and this is rarer in other categories than in books. Amazon is very liberal with how much higher we can price Prime and still win the buy box. So for that $13 book, if you sold a $13 book, you probably receive a $6 payout from Amazon. Let's pay, say you paid $2 for the book, you made $4 profit. Instead, with this pricing formula, you are going to price up to $19.50. Your payout's probably going to be closer to $12. If you had a $2 buy cost, now you're making $10 profit. So you just took yourself from just a few dollars profit to $10 profit. You over doubled your profit simply by repricing up at night. Scott Needham says at every opportunity, you should always reprice. And this should be raised to max, by the way. Um, so I, I do give you my complete template. There's only two you need to follow uh, to get this set up. But every opportunity you can, I recommend pricing up. We also have been experimenting with repricing up during the day. So this is a little bit aggressive, or I guess maybe conservative is a word for it. But once a day, from one o'clock to two o'clock, we raised our maximum price. And again, I personally use realistic max prices. I'm not going to raise my price to $300. But even if you did reprice your book to $300, this principle would remain true. I could give you like 10 different scenarios where pricing up and then the next day returning to your regular repricing settings helps you make more money. So uh, once a day, midday, during the highest volume of purchasing, we price up. Why do we price up? What you have to realize is that scale, if you have, let's say you do 100 orders a day. Well, out of those 100 orders, five people or 10 people are ordering on their lunch break at work. And how many times, drop a one in the chat if you've ever gone on Amazon and added a bunch of stuff to the cart and then someone calls you or something happens and you forget to check out the cart. And then like a day later, you check it out. Drop a one in the chat if you've ever done that. Give some shout outs real quick. Denise says yes, Amy says yes, Nancy says yeah, we do it all the time. Well, here's a pro tip for you on the purchasing side. If the seller decides to change the price, you will be charged a higher or a lower price on the items. So this is where ethics kind of come in, but Scott Needham does it. He's one of the biggest Amazon sellers. It makes me more money. So I'm gonna do it. I reprice my prices up once a day, midday, and some people end up paying more. Maybe they 
Maybe they paid more because it wasn't in the cart, but most likely the reason why I'm getting sales at a higher price midday is because they added the item to their cart. Before they checked out, they got to see that the price raised and they still decided to purchase from me. It just works at scale. So that's the, these are two pro tips. Um, there's also sales velocity pricing, but this does not pertain to booksellers. And then what we do after 90 days, and now that we have capacity limits and not restock limits, Again, Mike was talking about how he doesn't know how that's going to go during Q4. None of us know how capacity limits are going to be during Q4. I have a pretty aggressive repricing strategy after 90 days. Not, that might be a little premature for booksellers. You guys could extend this to 120 days if you wanted to, but I want to get my money back as quickly as possible. I want money in the bank as quickly as possible. I don't want to have to wait a year to make a profit. So after 90 days, what we do is we reprice one penny under the buy box. A lot of people on YouTube you know, shun this, but hey, I'm not gonna hold on to 20,000 dud books forever. I'm gonna sell them. And so we lower by a penny after uh, 90 days. And this software is, you know, it's, this is a very fast software. It's way faster than Be Cool. 10, 100, probably 200 times faster than reprice it. This is a powerful software. Um, and I, I don't really understand that much about like the API calls and stuff they do, but I just know that this is up to par with, you know, some of the thousand dollar softwares that people pay for each month. And it's only 50 bucks and they do not pay me. They, they have never paid me anything um, today. They might pay me something. We'll see if my affiliate link works, but um, I finally got an affiliate link set up with them because I, I respect them so much. And hopefully they'll, you know, work with GoTo Lister in the future, but it, it's been a good software for me and it's made me a lot more money. Um, it is, I will warn you, like if you, if you guys don't want to like manually have to upload stuff each week, don't use this software. Um, but I will give away, it's like a 20 minute course video. I might even post it on YouTube where it shares my exact strategy on how to do this. And that should be sent to you like the next day or two. So, um, let me open this up real quick. I, I talked way too much. It's almost time for the next speaker. So this QR code on the right is going to give you uh, my affiliate link for Channel Max. If you guys don't want to go through my affiliate link, you can just go to channelmax.com. But this will, they only pay me 50 bucks if you stay for three months. So I'm actually trying to negotiate like a, a better affiliate program, but figured I might as well see how many people actually sign up. Uh, another pro tip, if you do use Channel Max, nothing on their website's intuitive. I personally don't think, I think the good thing that Be Cool's done and Aura and these other softwares that like, like GoToLister, GoToLister is intuitive. Like you can look at the software and it kind of tells you what to do. It's sexy. Channel Max is one of those softwares, just not very pretty. And like nothing's really intuitive. So like even today I logged in, I'm like, I don't remember what any of this stuff means. Like my FBA listings, target buy box. What does that even mean? Target buy box? Like or and, and this is this is trying to go under buy box. And so it's not very intuitive at all. And so what I recommend you do is use this live chat support. They literally will answer you in like 30 seconds and ask them all the questions here. And I actually recommend all of you when you set up your settings, Zoom call with them just to make sure that you didn't screw anything up. I literally Zoom call with them every time I make changes. And that's why I like this company so much. Uh, their customer service is, is amazing. So again... I'll put my affiliate link in the chat. I'll drop, I'll drop it in the chat too during uh, Steve's talk if you guys want to sign up for that. But um, yeah, let's dive into some quick Q&A about repricing. I'm sure you guys have questions and then we can, I'll leave this on the screen for a little bit. So don't freak out that you can't see my beautiful face. I'm going to leave this on the screen so you guys can sign up. And then, um, yeah, let me answer some questions real quick. Raise your hands. Let's see who we have first. I'm gonna have to stop sharing my screen for a second. City End, what's up? You wanna unmute yourself real quick? Hello? Hello? Hey, how you doing? Hi, yeah, I have a question. Let me okay. see if I remember that. Yeah, Hopefully I have an in answer. Terms okay. of box size, um, the box sizes, what's the best size to fit like uh, 
approximately like 30, 35 books or to make it like a 45 pounds. Because I've been using the 17 by 11 by 11. And That's too I'm big. Able... Wait, it's 17 big. by 11 by 11. Wait, how, how, how many are fitting in there? I thought you were about to say it's 17 by 11. It's, um, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Last night could only fit um, 24 books. Yeah, I recommend 12 by 16 by 12. You can purchase these at Home Depot and you can also purchase them at U-Haul. They're small size boxes at Home Depot. You could even get the extra small boxes. You might fill it up to 35, 40 pounds, but you're definitely not going over 50. Um, so that's okay. what I recommend. 12 by 16 by 12. Okay, and one last question. Yep. The books that I get from next door, because now I have piles of books. What do you guys do with them when after like you go through and um I recommend giving whatever sellbackyourbook.com is paying for to them. So use Scout IQ and if sellbackyourbook.com is paying uh for them, or you can use Booksy. Uh I don't know if they tell you if sellback your book's paying for them though. But basically, see, is sellback your book gonna offer you cash? And if so, send them to sellback your book. If not, don't freak out over it. I wouldn't try to sell them on eBay. Like wasting money on shit books is way worse than going out and finding better quality books. So just give the books back to Goodwill or Salvation Army or trade, give them to a local library, preferably like your worst source, just go give them books. Okay, great. And sell back in books is on um, go to lister? No, not yet. We might, if you guys want it, we can get that. Okay. I'm All waiting until right. we get no. more users out, but uh, we can definitely integrate with them soon. The thing is, like on GoToLister, you're at the point where you're listing the book, and so most people already like know they want to sell it on Amazon. So that's why we haven't done that yet. Okay. All right. Yep. Thanks, so much. Next questions. You guys can raise your hand. Johnny, you got a question? You got to unmute yourself, buddy. <laughs> oh, you dropped it in the chat. Uh, Johnny Flip says, uh, 2,300 cubic foot uh, feet approximately. Uh, Barnes and Noble boxes are great. 19 by 14 by nine, nice. Other questions specifically about repricing because I want to help people with repricing. I always get questions. So this is y'all's time and then we'll get Steve up here. Uh, Brenda, what's up? Got to unmute yourself. There we go. Yeah, is there a repri um, repricing that we don't have to continuously check every evening that it automatically just does it? Yeah, well, that's what all these repricers do. It's all automatic. You don't oh, have to. You... Go ahead. Well, what? Uh, go ahead. What do you think you have to do? Well, yeah, I thought um, in what you were telling us that we had to um, we had to check it in the evenings. No, no, you don't have to do anything. Everything's automated. What you have to do once a week, what I recommend is you have to up, Channel Max requires you to upload minimum and maximum prices. And so on a weekly basis, in my video that I'm going to message you, um, I show you exactly how to do that. It is a little bit tedious, but I have a virtual assistant do it for me. Shout out Rustum, who's here helping out today. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, it, it's all automated. That's the purpose of a repricer. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, Sorry, Bruce. I was trying. I was trying to talk, oh. but it, it said I couldn't okay. unmute myself. What's up, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're going to include it in the video probably about the channel max settings. But so I know you said to make your uh, maximum price realistic. I'm sure you have a virtual assistant do that. So what's your guidelines for that? Is it double or triple low merchant fulfilled? I do one and a half times low FBA or buy box. So. Um, yeah, in the video course, you'll get it as well, Johnny, if you're on my For email sure. list. Um, I, it, yeah, again, it's a little bit tedious, but basically we just, uh, we look at all the buy box price and you just it put, input a quick formula into an Excel sheet and we do either one and a half to two X, kind of up to you. Depends on like, sure. what your average sales price is. And then for the minimum price, books don't really make too much profit under eight bucks. So I actually set mine at $8 and 50 cents because I, a lot of books that are priced at cheap, the only reason why you picked it up is because it's so fast selling. And so you should get your money for those books. Even setting a minimum price of $10 is uh, not a bad idea. When I first started using Channel Max, I actually raised, I never had minimum prices, but Channel Max requires you to put minimum prices. So I raised my minimum prices. There's a bunch of six, $7 books that I had. I raised everything to like, I think $10 when I first started, or maybe $8 the first day. And then like, the third day I raised 10. 
and my unit sold double. And so I think it was something to do with like the software is just way faster than reprice it. Like it just it, it, every few seconds, it's, it's uh, or every few minutes, it's updating prices. Um, but literally, my my sales doubled for like several months. It wasn't like a three day span of of more sales. It just they doubled for an extended period of time. Sandra, what's up? Or uh, Bruce, let's get Bruce first, and then Sandra, and then we'll get Steve out here. Um, I'm dealing with the forever, every single day, the same 25 books come up on the pricing health where they're uh, saying yeah. the minimum price or the maximum price is too much. And it doesn't matter what I set it to the next day. It's right back to where it was. So frustrating. Um, wait, what do you mean? The next day it's back to where it was. Like, are you using reprice it channel max? I've got be cool running. Okay. Um, but it, it's, it's not resetting the price to below the minimum. Yeah. Wait. So you're saying the problem is every day it gets repriced back to the price that's causing the deactivation. The every day Amazon says it's back under the minimum price. And so the price. Oh, the minimum price. Uh, does Be Cool have your minimum prices? Do you have minimum prices set for these books? Yeah, I do, but none of them are ever the price that Amazon's complaining about. Uh, set. Make sure you have minimum prices set on Be Cool and on uh, Seller Central. So on Seller Central, make sure there's a minimum price set. If you like search this SKU in your manage inventory, make sure an actual minimum price comes up. And then on Be Cool as well. But the one on Amazon's always going to override whatever Be Cool suggests. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would check manage it or. The other issue could be maybe on Amazon, you have a minimum price of like $16, but maybe you're trying to price it at 15, maybe B equals trying to price it at 15. Amazon will also deactivate it in that case. So make sure your your minimum price on Amazon isn't set above what B equals trying to price it at. So there's no easy way to compare the two to see who's got what? Go on Be Cool and just look at your minimum price. You should be able to somewhere on there. I don't use it, but it, just ask their support. How do I see my minimum price? And then on Amazon, uh, just go to Manage Inventory and they have your min max price there. Okay, thanks. Yep. Sandra, what's up? All right, Roz, <laughs> what's up? Roz, if you want to unmute yourself. Ask you to unmute. Can you hear me? Oh, Sandra, yes. Yes, I can. Okay, please be patient with me because I've never done this before. I just all. couldn't see you trying. Most of the time I can see people struggling, but you didn't have your camera on. So I don't know. Okay. I, I, yeah. so, so when you um I, I just I just need to see if I can drive this so can I understand it a little bit, okay? Because I'm at ground zero here. Yeah. I saw you training. I said it looks good. I gotta start here. So here I am with you because you look yep. promising. All right. So <laughs> I mostly have, I, I don't need to go to thrift stores. I've got books in my garage. Most of them, a lot of them are paperback. Some of them are not. A lot of them aren't. And then some of them are in very good condition. And a, a lot of them are, you know, the fiction and nonfiction stuff. And from what I, from what I, I would think, um, I would need to somehow determine what the price would be for it. And you said that $8 generally is the lowest price that you can price something and make a profit. And then I don't understand how shipping costs factor into it. Do yeah. You, yeah. Do you so, so um, Scott IQ is going to show you all this for Booksy, as uh, Omar mentioned. So if we type in biology 11. Um, oh, you just locked me out. Um, my mom must be out scanning books. We share an account. Basically, if you scan it with Scott IQ, it's going to factor in all the fees, what the FBA fees are. Amazon always takes 15%. Amazon, uh, the app will even factor in what you have to pay to ship it to Amazon. So what you see on Scott IQ is already factoring in all the fees. I say $8 low price when it comes to repricing, but when you're out in the field, uh, scanning books, Scott IQ already factors in all the fees. I do have a completely. Would I be book. scanning my books? Uh, yeah, some of them are so old they don't have it. They don't have. 
Yeah, you well, then, then what you can do is you can uh, manually type them in, or as Johnny was saying, you could uh, take your phone out and scan the cover. Um, but I have a free course. Let me put this in the chat. If you go to starthumble.com, the word start and then humble, I have a, a full course that shows you exactly how to sell books, 100% free. It walks you through everything. Um, so that'll, that'll show you how to scan the books at your house, how to make your first shipment, um, how to, I literally like go through like dozens of books and tell you, I would buy this book. I wouldn't buy this book. Uh, so you can go to starthumble.com for that, for that course. Thank you, thank you. And that, yep. that's, all right. About all right. I, I'm un, can I ask a quick question? I'm unmuted. Yeah, yeah, go for it real quick. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Uh, just we good, quick. Sandra? Huh? Uh, I said thank you, Sandra. Thank you oh, very okay. much. Yep. Um, I just want to ask real quick. So the the minimum price has always been very confusing, and the issue is is I I I'm having a hard time figuring out what the break even is because you know as a new seller we have a ton of subscriptions that go in and everything else that should be factored into the cost of the book. Don't you agree? No, so no, you don't want to factor it in the cost of the book. So like on go to lister, when you list, I mean like at scale, yes. Um, yeah. But like on go to lister, you only want to put in like, what did you actually pay for it? So if you pay $200 for 200 books, put in $1 by cost. But I see what you're saying. Like on a, on a grand scale, how much profit I'm actually making. You're probably paying $200 in subscriptions between go to lister, right. you know, seller, scout IQ, um, maybe you got a reselling freedom membership, whatever it is, you got all these things. So let's say your total costs are 200, then, you know, divide 200 by, if you sell a hundred books per month, then you have a $2 added, you know, just a fixed cost exactly. in software. So yeah, but that's like kind of like a different issue. Um, but what was your question about that? Well, so, so I have been, the only thing I have not done yet, um, is I have not put in the minimum, um, I have not put in the minimum amount. And so that's kind of throwing all my repricing issues because when I put what in you, the minimum- What are you currently amount, using for repricing? What software? I'm using, well, I'm on a free trial with Reprice It, but I'm gonna mm -hmm. try your channel max soon. It's, it's up to you. I mean, Reprice It is not bad, but uh, I can't deny like, my experience with channel max so that's why i recommend it but um any yeah. repricing software is better than none so you never go in and recover the cost of of all the subscriptions and everything i should just forget about that i don't input go... that knowing the software at all it doesn't matter it's like it, i get the same question from people like they buy like a pallet of books and they're like i spend a thousand dollars on these books so it's an average of dollar buy cost per book and like so many of the books aren't profitable i'm like once you pay for the books you forget about the buy cost you set your buy cost to zero because the books are already paid for then what okay. now what you're looking for is how many books are actually going to bring me more money if i send them to amazon and then you send all those books you don't factor in the buy cost at that point if you're in a thrift store like damien is no damien's not in a thrift store but it looked like he was <laughs> if, if you're in a thrift store and you're about to buy some books then you obviously you factor in because you have to pay two dollars right. at the checkout. So, okay, I'm just worried about monthly overhead and number of units sold. Yeah, you just got to figure out how many books you have to sell to cover your overhead. Okay. And like, look at what your overhead is, and then at least find that many books each okay. month. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry All right. Thanks. Yeah, you're good. All right. Next up, we have Steve Rake. Are you there, Steve? Breaking profit. Boom. There he is with his bald head walking on the treadmill. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, let Steve take it away. Steve, feel free to talk a little bit over. Uh, I'll text Joji and let him know um, that we're running a little bit late. So if you guys want to hang out, looks like we'll be going maybe till nine o'clock tonight. So I'm going to let Steve talk as long as he wants. Super impressive what he's done over the last year. Like I lived with Steve in 2020 and I was talking to Steve this morning. Somebody was complaining about this. Somebody was complaining that I was doing book selling boot camp. Two people, one person on YouTube and one person on Facebook. Somebody says he's not bald. He's just taller than his hairline. <laughs> um, somebody was complaining about this. And I'm like, it was on a post I made about Steve doing 90K. And I'm like, I'm genuinely impressed by Steve because I live with him. And at the time, he wasn't really selling much on Amazon. He'll be, he'll be uh, transparent about it. And then all of a sudden, he starts busting out 30, 50K months at a 30% uh, profit margin, right? If I'm not mistaken. And I'm just like... This is insane. So I did 300,000 last year, flipping items from eBay to Amazon 
And um, I'm really impressed that he was able to do this. And I'm also, uh, it blows my mind that people are complaining about me putting on a free event and like inviting people like Steve to speak. So with that being said, welcome Steve Rake and drop a one in the chat if you're excited for Steve to speak. What's going on everybody? Appreciate you guys. This 100%. has been awesome so far. I've been watching the whole thing and I am just excited. I am just, my head is shining. I'm walking on this treadmill and I am pumped up. So let me see if I could uh, share my screen. Okay, perfect. And super inspired by all the speakers as well. It was funny. Johnny is like, oh, I'm an amateur. I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, this guy sounds like he's been speaking for the last three years. So uh, big shout out to Johnny. That was fantastic. Yeah, he did great. I don't know. He, he took a public speaking course in college or what? <laughs> for real. So what's going on, everybody? My name is Steve Rakin, and I've been reselling for almost 10 years now. I started flipping bikes on Craigslist back in... 2013, 2014, when I started documenting my journey on YouTube. Then I went full-time with clothing for quite a few years. And then I started selling on Amazon around 2014, 2015. And uh, before I jump ahead, let me share the topic and I'll kind of get a, a bit more into my story. But uh, today I'm going to share five tips for adding eBay to Amazon flips to your book business in 2023. So don't worry if you're like, what are we talking about here? Are we gonna be talking about selling on eBay or are we gonna be talking about selling on Amazon? This is Amazon, okay? So stick with me. This is gonna be something that uh, you're gonna really enjoy. No lie, five minutes ago, I'm like, you wanna know what? I've got all this stuff that's been delivered to my house over the last uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Th so the last five days, this is everything that showed up to my house. And in my business, I buy items from eBay and I flip them on Amazon FBA. I've been doing this for almost 18 months. Um, and uh, in, in this pile, it includes, you know, used and new items from CDs to DVDs. Um, I actually sold a, a cassette tape today, a Michael Jackson one, believe it or not, I bought from eBay to Amazon, electronics, video games, supplements, tools, all different types of items. And uh, yeah, all this stuff is going to get uh, shipped out on Saturday, okay? Now, first, I want to give a big shout out to GoToLister and Avery for putting on this virtual event. I've been using GoToLister, how long has it been? What, about 30, 30 40 days since I've been using it full-time, Avery? Yeah, something like that. You've been, you've been hustling, though. I see those numbers on the dashboard. Yeah, so um, these are my exact numbers. You can see my name right there. I've shipped out 23 batches with GoToLister, and uh, that's a little over... Uh, 1,300 SKUs, uh, a little over $26,000 worth of inventory that uh, is going to net around 21,000 profit. And again, when, when I say net, it could be a little higher, it could be a little lower uh, based on how uh, things turn out. But yeah, big shout out to GoToLister. I've really been loving it. So from 2014 to 2021, I was sourcing my inventory mostly from thrift stores. I mean, I was I was the guy who was going out every single day hitting Savers and Goodwill and Salvation Army, going to yard sales on the weekends, book pickups and library sales, flea markets, auctions. I documented a bunch of this on my YouTube channel at Rake and Profit. I'm sure a lot of you guys here have probably seen my, my videos at one point or another. This is actually a picture when I, when I hit my 100,000 subs, which was pretty crazy. And then all of a sudden, about 18 months ago, uh, my life kind of came to a screeching halt, literally, uh, on the highway at about seven at night, got hit by a gigantic commercial truck. Um, I don't know if it looks as bad as it felt. and uh, But all in all, this is a Toyota Tacoma. The thing had about 18,000 in damage, and uh, I'm lucky to be alive. Um, ultimately, after the accident, I started having like anxiety and panic attacks. And, you know, it wasn't even like, I got really lucky because it hit me dead on. But I guess after the event, I started to think to myself, like this freaking huge commercial vehicle hit me at like 70, 80 miles per hour. If it hit me a little more to the left or the right, because you could see it hit me dead on, it would have spun me out and I probably wouldn't be here talking. So after that event, I really just started freaking out driving and I would have panic attacks and anxiety. And I already, I already had a freaking bunch of issues to begin with. So that didn't help. So I was like, I got to figure out a way to be able to source inventory without having to drive all over the place like I've been doing the last you know, five, six years with just Amazon. So um, at this point, I said to myself, man, I remember like I've, I've flipped probably, I don't know, 10 to 20 items from eBay to Amazon over the 
last five or six years, but everyone always told me, you can't do that. You're going to get kicked off. You're going to get suspended. Jeff Bezos is going to come over to your house and, uh, you know, call you a bald little boy without an invoice, you know, but that didn't happen. 18 months later, I've sold actually close to 400,000 with this method over the last uh, year. Uh, I'll share with you my numbers in a second. It's it's close to 350,000, but essentially I was forced to find a new way to source and I started doing eBay to Amazon flips. And eBay to Amazon isn't anything that complicated. It's the same exact model essentially as just going to a thrift store or a garage sale or going to an auction or a book pickup, or maybe you build a relationship with a recycling company. Um, the only difference with eBay to Amazon flips is you're buying from Amazon. Everything else is the same. You're still listing your items, you're shipping, and then you're obviously rinsing and repeating with you're the buying from eBay, not Amazon, right? Excuse me. Yeah. I'm buying from eBay and selling it on Amazon. So it's all pretty much the same when you're selling on Amazon, excuse me. So, um, but you, you were diving into Joji's content. Joji will be talking oh, about man. Amazon to Amazon. I, you know, I'll tell you right now, Amazon and Amazon flips are fantastic. So be sure to stick around for Joji's call. But there's three main differences everyone has to keep in mind before getting into eBay to Amazon. So number one, the biggest difference, of course, is your sourcing online versus physically going out to thrift stores, libraries, garage sales, auctions, all of that, right? That's obvious. Number two, the cost to acquire inventory from eBay is a lot more expensive. So I'm not here to blow smoke up your you-know-what. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of benefits to this model, but there are some downsides. And I would say for a lot of people who are brand new, maybe you're on a limited budget, you don't have a lot of experience, I wouldn't start by doing this method. But once you get at that three to six month mark and you want to scale, you want to maybe raise your average selling price, or maybe you're going through some restock limit issues, this model can really help. And number three, the profit margins will be much less. So not only is it more expensive to buy the inventory, but the profit margins are much less. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, Steve, what the heck are you talking about here? Why would I want to, why would I want to get into a business model where I have to spend more money on the inventory and I'm going to make less profit? That doesn't make any sense. Like this kid, he's thinking like, what are you talking about? So let me share with you why I love this model and why you might want to look into this. Okay, number one, it allows me to source more inventory without having to rely on the luck factor. I want everyone to put a one in the comments. If you've ever felt like, I don't know, you're getting ready to go out thrifting and you're like, please, don't let there be a million other people there scanning barcodes. Please, don't have that mean person at the library, friends of the library, who's not going to let me go in the back, right? Please. I want Goodwill to bring out those beautiful blue carts or those big, beautiful red carts from Savers, right? There's like a luck factor involved. Of course, if you have the right tools and softwares and you know what you're doing, you understand how to analyze items, you're going to have a comp competitive edge. But that luck factor, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I, I kind of want to get out of that. Also, number two, when you're sourcing from eBay, you can cherry pick fast selling inventory which is what Amazon wants right now. I mean, the writing is on the wall. If you're an Amazon FBA seller, I'm not talking about merchant fulfilled. I'm talking if you're only FBA and you don't want a merchant fulfill, maybe you want more freedom. Maybe you don't want to be that hands-on. Maybe you travel a lot. If you're going to be an FBA seller, it's the most obvious thing in the world that Amazon is punishing sellers who are selling items, who are selling items that are slow selling, and take a long time to sell. They're punishing you in a whole bunch of different ways, from restock limits to uh, shorter uh, long-term storage uh, duration, so on and so forth. So with this model, you can really cherry pick items, okay? And number three, this is probably what I love most about this model, is you can outsource it to virtual assistants to have more freedom. And in my business, you might be thinking like, wow, how is he doing, you know, over $300,000 a year. And now I'm a little over 50,000 a month. I'll, I'll share with you my sales in a minute. Like, how is he doing that as a one man team, one man show? And the truth is I have, I have a team. I have two people who help me list and ship. And then I have two virtual assistants who help me source. And then I have two other virtual assistants that help me behind the scenes. But if you're looking for a business that you can scale and you don't want to be the only one in the business, this is a really great opportunity. And and if you don't want to have a warehouse, if you don't want to be dealing with bulk books and Gaylords, which is still great for a lot of people, 
for me, God bless everybody out there who wants to have a warehouse and bulk books. I think it's a great opportunity, especially with Merchant Fulfilled. Um, but for me, that would be the last thing in the world I'd ever want to do. But still, it's a great opportunity. So before we get started, let me share with you my results. So you can take a look on the left. This was actually from this afternoon at about 1.30. I've done a little over, uh, a little under 52,000 in sales. And uh, if you look on the right, you can see my sales tanked in January. Essentially what happened is uh, I got a little burnt out and didn't ship any of the stuff that I purchased. So my inventory went from close to 27, 2,800 down to a thousand items in my inventory. And uh, my sell through rate, my profit margins ROI was still great, but I didn't have anything in my inventory. So I decided to give myself a little kick in the butt, got things shipped back in, had a great month last month. And uh, this month I'm hoping to hit a record month. So did a, a little under 350,000 in the last uh, 12 months. And the goal for uh, this year is 750,000. So my profit margins currently after Amazon fees, cost of goods, software, and virtual assistance comes to about 25%. So on 750,000, I'm hoping that I could profit around at least 150,000 off of that. So my team and I, we source and ship anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 items per month that we source from eBay. And then we prep it all up, put it in boxes, and uh, ship it to Amazon FBA. We pay on average about 15 to $18 uh, per item. And that's on average. Sometimes I buy items for 150 and sell them for 300. Other times I'll buy items for seven and sell it for 30. But on average, we're paying about 15 to 18. And our selling price is uh, between 38 and $45 currently. So let's get into the five tips for how to flip from eBay to Amazon. And that was my living room before uh, my girlfriend decided that I was going to be living in the street if I uh, didn't move things into the garage. So check out my YouTube channel. I'm going to be doing a, uh, a whole series on turning my garage into my Amazon space at Rake and Profit. So definitely check that out. <laughs> so, all right. So let's talk about- If you guys aren't already subbed him, we got his YouTube channel in the link uh, in the description below. So make sure to, to join that. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Avery. So- yeah, so tip number one, I would highly recommend everybody, regardless if you do eBay to Amazon or you're just going to thrift stores or auctions, yard sales, whatever, get ungated in CDs and DVDs. Now, you know, Mike and Avery had to ruin my slide and, you know, share all this uh, secret sauce, right? Secret sauce, it's not really a secret, but uh, yeah, essentially uh, what I recommend is go to christianbook.com. Here's the website. And what I would recommend doing is go to the bargains or the sales section on the website. So you could go under um, like whatever category and uh, it'll say like bargains and sales and you could filter it for the lowest items and try to find CDs and DVDs with a rank less than 80,000, not 80 bucks. I don't know why I put the dollar sign here, less than 80,000 rank because when you're getting ungated, a big misconception a lot of people have is they think they're trying to get ungated to make money. You're not trying to make money. You're trying to make, you're trying to minimize the amount of money that you lose and just sell through your inventory as fast as possible. Because what's going to happen is you're going to buy 10 CDs or 10 DVDs, or maybe buy 10 of both because you want to get ungated in both. Um, you're going to receive the items. There's going to be an invoice in the box. You've got to mark it up a special way. I'll share with you how to do that on the next page. But then you're going to submit that to Amazon. You're going to get ungated. And then you're going to ship everything to Amazon. And your goal is just to sell through it as quick as possible and get your money back so you can start investing it in books, DVDs, CDs, whatever it is that you're buying and selling. So right here, you could scan this um, QR code and it's not gonna ask you for an email or anything. It's just gonna bring you right to a Google doc that I have where it's gonna literally share with you step by step by step what to do. And it'll share this invoice, where to highlight things, what to do and everything. So um, be sure to take a picture of this or um, I don't know if we're gonna have a replay or whatnot of this, but um, I could definitely share it with you guys in uh, Avery's Facebook group or whatnot. Yeah, we can add this in the description of the replay. I think everything should go well with the replay and we'll post it on YouTube. Okay, cool. And keep in mind, I've helped hundreds of people get ungated for free, just friends, people. If you ever ask me, I'm not going to, I'll just share with you how to get ungated for whatever things. But um, I've had friends of mine, my buddy Jerry, who lives in town uh, where I live, it took him eight tries to get ungated. 
So if they reject you, just close the case and resubmit it. And sometimes you just got to keep trying and trying. It just depends what rep is uh, helping you out. So it's just part of the game. Tip number two, flipping from eBay to Amazon, okay, is you want to source items that sell fast, okay? Like I shared before, the game has changed. There's nothing wrong with picking up a 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, I guess even a 5 million ranked book if you get it for pennies on the dollar and you're going to merchant fulfill it. And, you know, you're just going to sell it. If it. Maybe it takes a year, year and a half, right? This is different. When you're doing eBay to Amazon, you're spending 10, 15, 20 bucks on an item. So if you don't sell your stuff quickly, you're going to hit cash flow issues super quick. And what that means is you're going to run out of cash. All your cash is going to be stuck in products that don't sell. And that's the quickest way to go out of business. So especially when you're doing eBay to Amazon, online arbitrage, wholesale, any of these, I guess you could call them more advanced uh, techniques to source. You want to make sure you go after items that sell a bit quicker, okay? Now, I'm not saying to avoid books over 500K. I have a friend of mine who does eBay to Amazon flips. And uh, actually, Joji, who's coming on next, he does a lot of eBay to Amazon flips and Amazon to Amazon flips with books. He'll go after longer tail stuff, but you really got to know what you're doing. So these are just some uh, standards that I really look for. And these are general rules of thumb, okay? All because there's an exception, it doesn't mean that should be the rule. There's exceptions to these, but in general, take a picture of this. And if you're doing eBay to Amazon flips, I would stay within these ranges, okay? All right. So I think everyone should have a picture of this or a screenshot. Tip number three, this is, this is like one of my secret sauces. A lot of people think software is everything in a business. Software is important. You can leverage software to, to do more things, to get more leads, to, to buy more items. But my whole entire business doesn't revolve around a software to buy items from eBay and sell on Amazon. There's a lot more to it. But the best software that I've found to be able to find items on eBay and have a software filter everything on eBay to find all the stuff that's selling the best for the most money, the most profit, the most ROI, the best sales rank, whatever category you want, is a software called Flipmine. Um, so Avery did give me permission to share this. I don't own this software. I am an affiliate to them because I love them. And uh, yeah, big shout out to David, who is the owner of this. And fun fact, David, you probably don't know this, Avery, David, the founder of Flipmine, he used to be a chemistry teacher, a high school chemistry teacher before he uh, ended up founding uh, this company. And uh, Joji's a chemistry teacher as well. So I, I got a kick out of that when I heard about that. But um, if you take a look on the screen right here, essentially what you can see are different columns, like the condition, profit ROI. You can see the eBay image, the Amazon image. You can see the rank. You can see uh, like what the lowest FBA is used and new. So essentially you could set all different types of uh, I guess conditions, right? So maybe you want to go after CDs that are ranked between 50 to 80,000. You want to pay less than $7 and you want them to sell for more than 30 on Amazon. And you want to make sure that uh, maybe the eBay seller rating is more than uh, 95%. Maybe they have over 150 um, count of, of positive feedback. Maybe you want to make sure Amazon has no more than five used or new offers, you could set all of that up and you push a button and this will do all the work for you. Now it's not perfect, just like Scout IQ, Scout Lee, all these softwares, nothing's ever perfect just because we're having to work with Amazon's API, but this saves a ton of time. So definitely check this out. If you're looking to dabble in this, I think there's a 14 day or a 30 day, I don't know, there's a free trial. You could definitely check it out, but this is really, really helpful. And I recommend everybody goes and just plays around with this software. Uh, have a glass of wine, go enjoy yourself. Tip number four, if you're going to do eBay to Amazon, a big mistake that a lot of my students and people that I coach and just friends of mine who I help on the side, a big mistake that a lot of people make with this model is they see an item, maybe like this CD right here, and they see that it's selling for $31. Okay. And they're like, oh, I could pay 10 bucks, sell for 31. I'm going to make $9 profit. This is perfect but you've got to look deeper than just where the market is right now. And this applies the same if you're at a thrift store, if you're at a garage sale, if you're buying an item from wherever, you can't just trust what the price tag says. It's like if you're going to buy a new house and you're looking in a new neighborhood for a house, you're not going to just be like, oh, I'm going to pay $500,000. 
your real estate agent, if they're any good, they're going to do research and look at comparable sales and sales in the neighborhood to kind of see, you know, what these houses have been selling for previously. What are they selling for now? What's a fair price? And the same thing applies with Amazon. And of course, there's no MLS to look at a, you know, Amazon item, but there's Keepa. Keepa is the best tool for not only studying what the price is doing right now and the amount of offers and what your chances are of maybe selling the item, but you could take a look at what's happened in the past and what's likely to happen in the future. So Keepa is vast. There's so much to Keepa. I remember 18 months ago when I started this journey, I thought I knew Keepa. I didn't know Jack. I thought I did. But when you go to online arbitrage, there's so many powerful, powerful features that Keepa has that I just wasn't aware of, to be 100% honest. So um, I've learned so much, but all I could say is if you're going to get into this model, learn Keepa as much as possible. Look at the 90 and 180 day metrics. This is highly recommended. So don't just look at, oh, the price is 31. Go into Keepa, go into the data section down at the bottom, and you can see that this item right here, I can't see what the price is, but I can see that the rank on average over 180 days is a 91,000. The average rank over 90 days is 94,000. And then the current rank is 109,000. So this thing's probably due to sell. But you could also look at a whole bunch of other data points, like what's the 180 day average for the buy box? What's the 180 day average for the used merchant offers? Um, and just so much more. So research Keepa, I can't say it enough. Tip number five, take advantage of used items. I think one of the best opportunities to flip from eBay to Amazon right now are used items. Most sellers, including myself, are selling a lot of new items. And I, I love selling new items just because for me personally, I just feel like they're easier to deal with. Um, you know, they're new, they're new in the box. You don't have to inspect it. You don't have to test it. There's typically not parts missing. For me, I feel like it's easier to kind of gauge what, what to price an item at versus used. That's just my opinion. Um, but the thing is with used items, the margins are really, really high because there is a bit more risk. Um, there's way less risk with IP complaints. So intellectual property complaints are uh, certainly one of probably one of the biggest risks to doing, you know, thrifting, garage sales, eBay to Amazon, uh, especially with new items without having invoices. So you can really reduce that risk by selling used. Used items cost less. And many used items actually sell a bit faster depending on what category you're in because they're much more affordable. You will not believe how much I sell some of these new DVDs for all day long for 50, 60, 70 bucks all day long. Not everybody could afford that. I don't know why they would pay that much. They do. It's not my job to figure out why the market does what it does, but there's way less competition and it's more affordable. They cost less. There's less risk with IP complaints. The margins are high. So especially if you're a new seller, I would most definitely look into used items. So that's all I've got um, for if, if you guys want to ask some Q&A or um, if you have any questions for me, if you guys want any more help from me, you can definitely check out my masterclass and whatnot. This was approved by Avery. But yeah, that's all I have, Avery. Um, do you want to open up the floor for Yeah, me? Yeah, let's do some Q&A. Uh, if you guys have questions, uh, make sure your camera's on and raise your hand. You can either use the raise hand feature in Zoom or raise your actual hand and we'll look for you. If you use the raise your hand feature in Zoom because it throws you to the top. And we'll see who comes up first. Or you can just unmute yourselves, make it less work on me. Oh, there we go. We got, uh, we got Johnny. Yeah. With a question. What's up, Johnny? Hey, what's happening, Steve? What up, Johnny? Uh, so I was wondering, how do your virtual assistants deal with um, uh, categories or brands that are uh, either restricted or uh, obviously Seller Amp will probably tell you if it's restricted, but say something like Sony or, uh, you know, a brand that is typically gated off to, or I don't know if you're un or ungated in most of those big brands or if they kind of have a, you know, SOP that they follow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So um, we source a bunch of different ways. The, the reason I'm answering this, because it depends how we're sourcing. Um, we've sold so many items over the last year and a half that most of the items we purchase are off of our replens list. So we have a list of 
over 6,000 items now that we've sold before that we're constantly looking to buy every single day, okay? So we don't really have to worry about those items as much. Um, but when we are sourcing using Flipmine, Johnny, Flipmine has a really cool feature that will actually, you can integrate Flipmine with your Amazon Seller Central and it will literally tell you which items are restricted and you can hit a button called remove and they'll all get removed from Flipmine. Have, have you tried Flipmine at all, Johnny? No, yeah, I'm looking to, to give it a shot once I uh, get home from this sourcing trip, but a man only has so much time. <laughs> <laughs> are you selling um, CDs or DVDs? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I am. I honestly kind of don't do much CDs. I uh, For DVDs, I really only look for the DVD sets. Like, I, I honestly, I feel like my time is just better spent, you know, looking through the books and just cherry picking through the sets. But You'd be shocked, man. You would be absolutely <clears throat> shocked how fast DVDs sell, especially if you stay within 20 to 80,000 rank. I wouldn't go less than 20,000. And I share that because you're talking about the box sets and stuff. There's a lot of counterfeits, especially with DVDs, when you start dealing with box sets that are newer, modern, less than 20,000 rank. Um, if any DVD on eBay is has multiple quantities available, stay away from it. If it has multiple quantities sold on a listing, stay away from it. So um, if that scares you, which it should <laughs> a little, yeah. um, but again, I sold over 5,000 uh, DVDs last year. My account's 100% perfect. I have zero issues with my account. Not to say I will never, and I... There could be a day where I'm like, all right, guys, well, <laughs> I had fun, but um, <laughs> you've got to do your research. Um, my, my VAs also have uh, user access to my Amazon Seller Central. So fun little fact, if you give your uh, virtual assistants uh, user access to your Amazon Seller Central, there's a option to toggle on where they could actually log in to your Amazon Seller app and if they ever want to, they could always look up an item to see if you're restricted as well, or just log into Amazon. So that's how they deal. Cool. With Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thanks, Johnny. And great job today. Appreciate it. Let's get, uh, let's get Matt Wood. What's up, Matt? How you doing? Oh, What's not this on, guy. Not, yeah. not this guy. Oh, man. Why did you just go over to Steve's house, bro? <laughs> because he doesn't answer my text. Dude, come on the webinar, man. Oh, my God. He said you didn't handle the ice bath enough for him to respect you as a man anymore. Yeah, Steve's too busy in the sauna to answer my text messages. So, that's okay. so <laughs> I just sat through this for the, the last three hours so I can ask you a question. Sure, man. What's going on? All right. So um, keep a question. If you have a DVD that's like great rank, it's selling fast, the current buy box is lower than the 80 day or the 90 day average and 180 day average would you still buy it so like if the new like new offer count is going up and the the price is going down would you leave it alone because you don't know how far it's going to go down you got to be careful of course like if if the offer count is going up and you see the price going down uh, mm -hmm. i guess one thing i would do is i would go back over time to see like has this happened before like what's the lowest low like do you have an example of of maybe like this you don't have to share the exact item but uh, like what's it selling for and what's what's like the I always like to play a game of like what's the worst case scenario and if if you're using seller ant Matt um, yeah. or if you're just analyzing it however I like seller ant because you could plug in how much you're going to pay what you hope to sell it for but I'll also share a break even number so I, mm -hmm. I always like to ask myself what's the worst that could happen and what's the best that could happen and what am I realistically probably going to sell this for um the thing with E to A flips, there's so many opportunities out there. So, I mean, like me, I'm spending anywhere from twenty to 30000 a month. So I have a lot of capital I'm playing with. So I'm open to taking a bit more risks. Um, I don't know, obviously, your, your personal situation, but a lot of folks only have like five hundred to a couple thousand to spend. And I just mm -hmm. wouldn't spend my money on something if it's not like a, like a guarantee. Um, and I know there's no guarantee, but you could get pretty darn close to a guarantee with like a lot of the DVDs and CDs I source because they're discontinued. And it's like very rare that you're going to find like, I don't know, some liquidator come in with like 15 or 20 of them. Um, but yeah, if you want to elaborate a little bit more, if anything's coming to mind, let me know. Uh, so yeah, I don't have it up right now, but as far as I can remember, the buy box, like the current buy box price is like 78 bucks. And the average was like 89 or 90 bucks. But 
that was just because the new seller or the new offer count was going up so much. So it's like, it's, it's kind of hard to gauge like how far it's going to go down, how many more sellers are going to have on the listing. Yeah. So, I would, I, I would, I would say the best way, like you, if, if the item is turning really quickly, let's say for example, I don't know, maybe it has like a 30 or 40,000 rank and it's turning yeah. very quickly. Um, you could get in and out, but if it's like, there's some DVDs I mess with that are like 90, a hundred thousand rank. They might only have two, three, four sales a month. Um, if there's a bunch of sellers on it, like I know she could hit the fan really quick. So sometimes I'm just like, it's not worth it. But uh, if you're going to make like a good ROI, maybe you're going to do like, I don't know, 60 to 70%, which is pretty common on a lot of DVDs. Um, and maybe the worst case scenario is you're only going to make 10 or 15%, make it a learning experience. Um, you know, I make a lot of mistakes still um, in my business. And sometimes we do lose a couple bucks on an item, but uh, there's never really any situations where I lose a ton of money because I'm, you know, you know, you know, the game we've talked about this. It's a lot of one off items. So give it a shot. If it turns over quickly, if it has a good sales rank and a good amount of monthly sales, I would just be careful. It's like if it's a really slow seller because you don't want to get stuck with that. And then, you know, it takes four months to lose two dollars because you have your cash doing nothing. Right. All, all right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, that's yeah. all I had. Appreciate you, man. I'd appreciate it if you text me back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get let's get Elizabeth up next. Hey, so I have a couple quick questions, hopefully. First, I'm wondering, I know there's tons of tutorials out there. I've looked at Keepa. I'm working with it, trying to figure it out, like get fluent with it. But some good tutorials. A lot of the tutorials seem to... Um, not be for that really beginner person and yeah. then they all, yeah go ahead oh no I was just thinking yeah I, I was like I was imp I was like being empathetic I was like yeah it's like <laughs> I, what I remember when I was trying to learn it it's just like it was like bringing me back to like my college days like having to learn like different math problems I'm like what the heck are they talking about right yeah uh, so I didn't know if there was any I mean do you have tutorials for that? I've watched a lot of your videos, but can't tell you right off the top of my head if you have uh, a key. So um, I can't say that I have, I don't think I have anything too up to date, but uh, you're certainly inspiring me to do one. Um, Joe, Joe, if Are you subscribed to Joji Davenport by any chance? I'm not. Yeah, he's coming up next. Um, he's a really great guy. He was the uh, the high school chemistry teacher I was talking about. You should definitely check out his channel, Joe G. Davenport. Um, he'll come up next. He's he is really smart though. So it might be too like sometimes it's hard for me to understand because he's I'm like, this guy is so much smarter than me. But uh right. he does break things down really well and he is a teacher. So I would I would check him out. Um, but yeah, maybe Avery and I, Avery, if you're down, maybe one of these uh, you know, book club sessions, we can do like a keep a webinar. Put a one yeah. in the chat. Yeah, put a one in the chat if you guys would like that. Let's let's see if how many keeping nerves we got Just break it down for the beginners we got so many people yeah so. Hey, so then if i can ask one other question sure. right now i'm just fba just getting into it like a few months into it but what i'm wondering is um if you're when you start branching out to other products and whatnot mm -hmm. is the process as far as packaging and shipping and listing is it that much different than books or is it learning a whole new everything no i I really don't think it's too much different because think about it with books. You're not really doing any prep outside of like maybe using some goo gone and using your Scotty peelers. And there could be an occasional time where do you poly bag your books? I know some, my mom always does. And I'm like, you don't have to mom, but she loves to. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary, but um, I would say um, it depends on the category, but the best, this is just my opinion. I think the best stepping stone for every bookseller is immediately going into CDs and DVDs. 100% are you ungated um Elizabeth, Elizabeth not yet no but um after tonight I'm gonna I'm gonna pursue it yeah hopefully you took a picture of that resource because it's free and it walks you through step by step go to Christian book start scanning like I, I open up my Amazon seller app and I'll just scan the, the 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 pictures of like the DVDs and CDs and try to find something that's like 20 to 80 thousand rank lower the better maybe it loses a couple bucks but the whole goal of it is to again minimize your your loss get that invoice and get ungated because I'll tell you right now, um, it used to be a lot easier. It is getting harder because 
kind of the word has gotten out, I would say over the last year, probably due to me uh, and some other people sharing like how to get engaged in DVDs and stuff. But I'll tell you like CDs and DVDs at thrift stores, local pickups, even library sales. I went to my local library sale the other day. It was jackpot city with brand new DVDs. I was shocked. I got yeah, everywhere. It seems like They're everywhere. Um, yeah. It's going to be mostly new that does well, you know, similar to books. Most books aren't profitable. You have to scan through them all. So you could set up your custom triggers with uh, Scout Lee or Scout IQ and start scanning those CDs and DVDs. But the, the point being, sorry for the long rant, CDs and DVDs are some of the easiest things to uh, prep and ship. I would just say, if you're not going to be testing your CDs and DVDs, which I usually don't, first of all, because I sell mostly new, but when I do sell used, if it has like any serious issues or scratches, I just won't sell it because it's not worth um you know, obviously getting a return, which is now more expensive and obviously getting negative feedback. But um, CDs and DVDs, I promise you, that'll be the best decision you get into. And I wouldn't even worry about anything else. I'll, maybe just like books, uh, excuse me, board games and D, uh, video games, maybe another couple categories and puzzles you could look into. But you'll be busy for the next year with that if you haven't branched out yet, Elizabeth. Got it. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, let us know, guys, in the chat if it's okay if we just run a little bit late. We're already running late. Uh, I know you guys want to ask Steve questions. We got a line of people. I don't know if we can get to all of them, but drop a drop a yes in the chat if it's okay if we run a little bit late. <laughs> Bruce says no. Don't stop. <laughs> yes, Brenda says yeah. They they want you, Steve. So I'm gonna Man. I'm gonna keep keep going with you a little bit. I'll let you uh, run the Q and I'm working on something. So if you just want to pick people. Uh, who have their hand raised are you able to see the people with their hand yeah, raised yeah. Uh, okay yeah i'll let you flow with it how about uh leslie i don't know if i do i have to ask leslie to unmute i don't oh there we go she, she, there, she okay goes. thank you it wouldn't let me unmute uh it's <laughs> great to, it's great to see you guys in person i've been watching your videos for more than a year oh, wow. um thank you so i've been doing fba a long time i took a hiatus during restock limits um, I'm looking for a bit of a mindset shift because um, I'm a little freaked out over the increased removal fees and I'm spending too much time in the um, low value inventory that needs to be removed or mm. sold. So um, Avery, you were saying something earlier about a cost, like when you're purchasing inventory and you're using the scanning app, you're deciding whether to buy it. But then once it's already in inventory and it's been sent, the cost and the inbound shipping is a sunk cost. So I use BeQual and I love the uh, profit calculator, um, but I'm trying to figure out what my rock bottom is to sell it at cost or to try to stay a little above cost. Um, this is coming straight from Caleb Roth, who taught me like everything. Everything I say is basically from him. So his philosophy with that is like, don't think about it that way. Just think about how much is Amazon going to pay you? And so mm -hmm. if you can get paid zero from Amazon, meaning the book sold and you broke even, that's better than, you know, having to pay. Now it's a dollar fifty removal fee, which is wow. ridiculous. That means yeah. if you get a thousand items removed, you're paying $1,500 to get, I, like it, it is absolutely insane. So the way you should think about it is how, like you should be willing to go down. Now you should be willing to go down to, I, it would be better to sell a book for a negative dollar 49 cents than it would be to dispose of it. Wow. You know what I mean? That's probably yeah. why, actually, as I said that, that's probably why they're raising the disposal fees because now what sellers are going to do is previously I would never sell a book for $5 because it, or for $6 maybe, because it would lose me a dollar 30 cents. And when I say lose me, I'm not calculating the dollar I paid at Goodwill. That's going to increase the, the uh, that's going to decrease the profit even more, but you can't okay. factor in buy costs and stuff, you know, for, for 95 day old inventory. It's a bad idea. At that point, all you should be thinking about is how, because on average, 80% of your books will sell 20% mm -hmm. of your books won't. So the 20% that won't, you want to lose as little money as possible. So okay. My advice would be look at the current removal fee and sell the book at now my $8 price is probably like 
overly optimistic. We should probably lower that to like six dollars and fifty cents. So um, just look at the average weight of a book. Uh, what's the uh, break even cost on it? I think break even cost on books are like between six and eight dollars, depending on the weight. So maybe seven dollars would be safe. But okay. at this point, we're willing to go down probably to six because that would be a less of a loss than paying the dollar fifty removal. Right. What you don't want to do is hold on for way too long and then end up having to pay that dollar fifty removal when you could have maybe just broken even with it. So that's my advice. Yeah, um, that helps a lot. And I, and I want to stop having so much attention go on this low value inventory and put my time and to better uses because um, there's a lot of my challenge is always my death pile. So people always talk about sourcing. For me, my my pain point is listing and shipping um, because my basement is filled with inventory. <laughs> But thank you. That helps. Yeah. Uh, really, well, I got great. a little something for you to, to help you list a little bit faster. I was great, already great. I was already great webinar. I already had a corny plug already, but you could take it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Leslie. Appreciate you. Uh, let's see who is up next. Maybe uh, I think Avery might have been kicked off, but uh, I see it's it says Jennifer, but I know that's not a Jennifer. <laughs> What's going on, man? I don't know if you want to. Uh, <laughs> He's on his girl's phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, if someone wants to help unmute him. Oh, there we go. What's up, man? It might not be working. Yeah, well, it, it, says, it says you're unmuted. Maybe we'll let you figure that out. I think you need to like connect a mic or something. Yeah, we'll, we'll move on to uh, Sandra. If you wanna. Hey, Sandra. Hi. How they you say doing? A, well, they say a picture is worth a, a thousand words, right? So you can look at me and see that I am not a spring chicken. I'm 77 years old. I recently was discharged from the hospital with severe uh, COPD and um, and mobility issues. And I've, you know, so I I can't be running around to different places. And thankfully, I don't have to be. Uh, I have a, I have a garage full, a three-car garage full of stuff. I do not want to just haul it away and dump it out. A lot of it's books. A lot of things are other things, you know, little knickknacks and furniture, antiques. A lot of it's antiques. Not a lot, but anyway, I am not IT savvy either, and I have never sold anything online. So my question. And I don't mean to be redundant because I know you're here to uh, advance the programs that Amazon and whatever. But I, I want you to, if you can just keep it simple and tell me, since I'm starting from ground zero with limited capacity to understand stuff, I may have to rely to my grandchildren. Could you please tell me in little steps what, what I should do? What programs, if any, I should use? the simplest way to get started, and then I could build from there. Or is that not really appropriate question to ask? No, you're good. I'm just letting Steve unmute himself. You, was that for me or Steve? Whoever. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so I, if you got books in the garage, just download Scott IQ and start with that. Like, see if see how that goes. Download Scout IQ. You can go to starthumble.com. My completely free course that walks you through how to scan a garage full of books and determine which ones are profitable. Make a few shipments, send them out, and see if you make money. You know, you you will make money if you scan the the books properly. And then okay, if you okay. like doing that, you can you can do something different. You know, you can do eBay to Amazon. You can uh, do some other model. You can go thrifting. But start with what you have in your house. Okay, you said go to Scott IQ. Yes, yeah, Scout right. IQ. It's like Scouting IQ. Dot co. And if you go to StartHumble.com, I have a, a course that walks you through everything. Oh, uh, Steve wasn't able to unmute himself. I guess Rustam's on top of that. Uh, I think we we changed the settings for this call. So Steve, if you want to weigh in on that as well. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you're going to have to be able to scan items. 
So you can use Scout IQ like Avery shared, or have you well, done? Well, these, these books don't have, I can't scan these. They're some of the very, oh, I won this from the 1800s. I mean, and not all of them, but I mean, there's some like that are first editions of a famous author. Just those are just two. But then I have a lot of like recipe books, lots of paperback books, textbooks that are so old, they're no longer useful unless it's. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of those might not be good for Amazon if there's no listings. What I was going to say is you could download the Amazon seller app, which is free. And if there's no barcode, there's a couple things that you can uh, do, Sandra. You could either scan the cover of the book. So it doesn't even have to have a barcode. Amazon okay. has a technology that will actually identify the item and, and find the actual listing if there's a listing there. So you could scan the cover. Um, you could also type the title of the item into Scout IQ or the Amazon seller app to try to locate the uh, the book through the title. And or if the book is, I think, when did ISBN number start coming out, Avery? It was like the 70s or 80s or something like that? Yeah, I think it was like 60s something. Yeah. If it has an ISBN number or it has a number inside, you could always type that in to try to find it. Um, so those are different ways. But uh, yeah, you could just get the Amazon seller app or Scout IQ and then you just have to list your items. I'd recommend okay. go to Lister just because it'll it has smart pricing. It'll price it for you. And it's I would say it's probably well over 90 percent accurate now, which you might be like, oh, that's not that's really good. I was actually surprised at how accurate it was. Um, I don't know if this is the right word, but there are different platforms right the platform would be like amazon is that correct yeah like you could sell it on ebay or you could sell it on amazon so some but books there's others as well correct yeah. i know it's not yeah there's a lot to it yeah there's a lot of we could sit here and talk for three hours about macari and facebook marketplace and a lot of different things i would probably just start with ebay and amazon to sell your items mostly Amazon if there's a listing and it's, you know, ranked according. So yeah, definitely check out Avery's uh, free course though. Um, what is it? Starthumble.com you said? Yep. Starthumble.com. But um, Scout yeah, Steve, Steve's YouTube it. channel as well. Like we have tons of videos where me and Steve met up. So just type in Steve Rake and all of his book videos, 50% of them have me in them. So <laughs> um, <laughs> go, go check them out. Thanks. Okay, and I'm going to get my garage cleaned, right? Yay, yay, yay. Let's yeah, go. yeah, get into it. Okay, thank you very much for taking yeah. the time and everybody participating, allowing me to take up their time because no I know they all do this. All right, guys. I, 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 don't, I don't understand how that selling, that booking, I don't understand how the shipping costs come in there. Yeah, I mean, well, is the, that the, the software factors all of it in. So go through Start Humble and then come back if you, if you got questions. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to hang out with you guys at the very end of this for any questions. Uh, Steve, he gets tired, so he'll probably go to sleep. But whichever <laughs> speakers want to hang around for uh, q and I will be doing the Q&A for the, for the people that want to hang out. Let's, let's drop a one in the chat if you guys are enjoying this, and let's get hyped up for Joji. Usually I do these events live, so I would get you guys out of your seat and get you jumping up and down, but I can't do that. And I'm feeling a little tired, so I know you guys are probably feeling tired. So like, hit that one button super hard. And uh, let's get that energy up. <laughs> but um, yeah, appreciate you, Steve. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Uh, go check out his channel. We've, we've linked it several times. Rustin will link it again below. If you guys aren't already subscribed, go subscribe to him. Go follow him on Instagram. And yeah, appreciate you, man. Yep. Thanks so much, guys. 100%. Real quick, before we dive into uh, Joji's content, which is Amazon, Amazon Flips, I want to go ahead and get this out of the way. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, go to Lister and the giveaway that we're doing. We'll do the giveaway after Joji's talk, but I just want to remind everyone what the giveaway is. And for some people that don't really know what go to Lister is, I'll go over that as well. So this is a $300 value for this wireless roller printer. Personally, I purchased the wired one for myself because I'm a cheapo. I didn't want to get the, the I, I purchased the wired one, not the wireless one. But the wireless one is like the luxury printer. Like this is this is dope. Like look at this. Uh, you can print from your phone. You can like if these were cheaper, we would make go to lister so you could just list all your items from your phone. 
that would be amazing. But uh, I don't want to make everyone buy a $300 printer. But one of you guys will have this. If you already have a printer, there's a lot of benefits to having two printers because you can have one print just shipping labels and one print just book labels. It's a huge hack. You don't have to keep switching labels. Um, this printer will print both types of labels. It's a really good printer. So, but in order to qualify, you must be here. Congratulations, all you guys are here. And you must have a GoToLister account, at least a free trial. And for everyone that already has GoToLister, uh, you will be enrolled as well. So we're about at 250 people uh, total so far using GoToLister. So big, big shout out to everyone who does use GoToLister. And I'm gonna give a shout out to everyone who's joined real quick as well. Let me open this up, Rustin texting me. So shout out to Coral, Sonia, Larissa, Jasmine, Dana, Elaine, Danielle, Maria, Lauren, Rick, Candy, Cindy, Christy, Caroline, Jeffrey, Adrian, Austin, Arcellus, Bikillen, and Carrie. Hopefully I didn't butcher too many of those names. Those are just the people that joined during this call. We've had dozens of other people join this week. So big shout out to all those people. And real quick, I do want to talk about a super exciting feature that's coming out. This is going to revolutionize the book selling industry and it's going to really open up the OA market as well. So if you guys do online arbitrage, you'll love this. If you are a bookseller, there's currently no book selling software out there that actually tells you accurate profit analytics. There are some that tell you they have accurate profit analytics, but they're not. We, we've studied the competition and there's none. So um, this will be rolling out in the next few days. My developer is almost done with this. My developer quit his job working as a developer for like a big company and he's 100% full-time go-to lister and he's been grinding away at this. So as you can see, you'll be able to see your sales. So if Steve, Steve did 50,000 sales last month, he'll be able to see that 15, 20,000 of it was true profit after buy cost. You know, um, so this is going to be really helpful and, and give you the confidence if you're buying thousands of dollars in inventory that you can actually scale because it's one thing to see $5,000 a month on your Amazon app, but how much are you really making? How much of that is really profit? So you can instantly log in and go to Lister. You can log in on your phone and see, oh, wow, I made 17,000 profit last month. Secondly, um, You'll be able to see each item and how much profit each item will make you. Because you're using GoToLister, you already entered the buy cost uh, when you listed the product. So on a product per product basis, you'll be able to see what the true profit is. So if the page will look like this. Uh, I think my developer has really good taste when it comes to user interface. Uh, if I tried to make the user interface that GoToLister had, I've designed my own web pages and they're usually pretty ugly. So uh, it'll be a, a pretty place for you to view how much profit you're making on a per item basis. And we'll also for all my eBay to Amazon people out there, for all my online arbitrage people, uh, he said it would be really easy to program uh, restock, how much you should restock. So that'll be within the next week or two as well. You'll see your your restock, uh, what you how much you should restock. So if you sold a CD that you flipped from eBay to Amazon, you'll see, oh, you should probably buy three more of these to have a 30-day stock or whatever. So this is the fastest listing software on the planet for booksellers. That's a $40 a month value. I just put it at 40 a month because that's what uh, the competition charges. There's some out there that charge like 70 a month that are not optimized for bookselling. So the competition, Acceler List, Scan Lister, these are softwares that are optimized for media sellers. Inventory Labs, is, it's an inferior software for booksellers. It's just not optimized for workflow. It takes forever to list on Inventory Lab. Uh, but they do have good profit analytics, which is the benefit of using them. You'll get smart pricing with us, which not, no one else offers that. That's a $200 uh, value per month. So basically we price at you know a higher price that can make you more profit if the item sells often. Uh, never miss out on restricted products. So a lot of people send me products at restrictedinventory.com that they shouldn't send me. So instead of sending all your products to me or selling them on eBay, which you can't really sell. You can sell items on eBay, but they sell so slow. So we check for all your product restrictions instantly so you can make more money. So even if we just catch two or three products that you can sell, that's a nine, at least $97 in profit because restricted products sell for a ton of profit. Uh, you're also going to get accounting and profit analytics. Uh, shout out to Taylor Jones, official, who's right here on the couch with his headphones on. He can't even hear me right now. Uh, he pays 70 a month just to see these two pages that I showed you before. So he pays for seller mobile and he just so he literally he just wants to see this page here. He pays 70 a month for it, which blows my mind. So he's gonna switch over to go to Lister pretty soon. 
the next couple of days once we roll that out. And all this adds up to a $407 value. But if you join today, it's just $49.99 a month. And this is for life, guys. So for whoever joins today, once we raise our prices, and it is raining like crazy here in Puerto Rico, I apologize for the noise. Uh, we're never going to raise the price on you. So you're in for $49.99 per month for life. So uh, there's all this value that that's here. We're not going to charge you on a, we're not going to charge you individually for profit analytics. We're not going to charge you individually for listing. We're not going to charge, you are locked in at $50. For life. So if you join and you think that this software can save you, if you don't think this software can save you at least $407 a month in efficiency and insight into profit analytics, you can cancel at any time and you won't get charged anything. You won't even get charged $49.99 a month. And this is going to put you in the running for this beautiful Rolo printer here. So real quick, I'll show everyone how you can sign up for GoToLister. Go to GoToLister dot com. I'll fill it. There we go. Just like this, you can scroll down on the page and see all of our features, basically everything I just talked about. Uh, no other software does the zero FBA offers things. That's something we do. And also I'll show you one more thing. So all you'll have to do is click on free trial and this is going to sign you up for a free trial. Again, you won't be charged. You can cancel at any time. No charge. we will put you in the running for the Rolo. But one of my features that I was super excited about that we released is our speed mode. So I'm going to copy, usually I show you guys like physical books, but I'm here in Puerto Rico and I need to go buy some books. So I currently don't have any near me. Let's see if we can open up an in progress batch. So what we've done is sometimes Amazon slows down. So my Wi-Fi is surprisingly fast here in Puerto Rico, but if I did have slow Wi-Fi, what I could do is I could scan in like five, 10 books. So watch, I'm going to tell you every time I scan a book in, this is one book. This is two books. This is three books. This is four books. This is five books. That's how fast I can scan. I can scan even faster than what I just did. And it tells you if uh, you're restricted, it breaks all that down for you. And um, so yeah, this is a software. We, you don't have to wait on Amazon's slow API return. You can scan as fast as you want. So again, go to gotolister.com free trial to sign up for that. So we have our last speaker who specializes in Amazon to Amazon flips. And I believe he buys from eBay as well. He's done six figures in the last year. He's part of fire, which is anyone who's part of, uh, who has fire in their Instagram bio, they are extremely motivated to save money and create wealth. So this guy knows what he's doing when it comes to flipping items for a profit and growing his bank account. Welcome, Joji Davenport. He's a chemistry teacher. He just got off work. He's out on Pacific Coast time, and he made some time to, to share some knowledge on how he sells six figures every year in textbook. Uh, drop a one in the chat for Joji, guys. Appreciate you. What's up, brother? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me, Avery. So hello, everyone. My name is Joji Davenport. I'm a high school chemistry teacher, and I'm also... Uh, a six-figure Amazon FBA bookseller. And, you know, I basically work all day. And the only time I can buy books is when I'm at home. And I have I have a newborn. I have my wife that I have to be with as well. So basically, I buy books basically between like 10.30 p.m. to midnight and like 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And last year, I was able to do 105,000 in sales, which was about 30K in profit. And I know you're probably thinking like 30K in profit is like not a lot of money, but that's on top of my teaching income. So basically, with my teaching income and the amount of money I make from Amazon, I make well over a hundred thousand dollars, which means that um, because like it, like Avery said, I'm super motivated to try to reach financial independence early in life. So basically, my wife and I almost live entirely off of my Amazon FBA income. So we live super frugally, and we invest over a hundred thousand dollars a year in the stock market, and we've been doing that for a few years now. And the goal is by age 35 to hit a two million dollar net worth. So right now we're 28 years old. And uh, that's the plan. So I do have both eBay to Amazon and Amazon to Amazon uh, kind of slides shown for you. But because I think Steve went through the eBay to Amazon, you kind of have a good idea of how that works. So what I'll do is show you some interesting ways to buy books on Amazon and flip them back on Amazon. And let me go and share my screen so you can see what that will look like here. All right. So if you can see my screen, can you just some of the people, can you just give me a thumbs up? Can I see like, people? okay, cool. All right, so Amazon to Amazon flips. And I made this little icon. This is Keepa in, in this little 
uh, on this little television because the entire way that you would do this is using a software called Keepa. And if you are a serious Amazon seller, then you have Keepa and you already know how to use it. Um, but you may not have used some of the features that Keepa has for sourcing. And so today I'm going to talk about those three different strategies that Keepa offers for booksellers in particular that allow you to find books on Amazon that are super undervalued that you can buy and then just resell them back for what they're actually worth. Okay, so first thing I want to start off with is if you're somebody who comes from the online book arbitrage world at all, at all there are these three different softwares. You got eFlip, you have Zen Arbitrage, and you have Master Book Flippers, and they all charge you at least $79 a month. And really the way that all of those softwares work is to buy the lowest merchant offer on Amazon and then flip them for an inflated buy box price, or maybe not necessarily inflated buy box price, but definitely the way that you would make money is not by, by buying something undervalued, but in some way exploiting this customer experience that prime sellers actually want things quicker. And so they might be willing to pay more money for it. So as an example, I just pulled up a book like this. So one of these softwares might say, hey, you might say, hey, buy this book right now at the lowest merchant offer for about $10 free shipping, and then just flip it over here for the buy box, which is currently 61 bucks. And obviously, if you did that, that would be a great margin and you'd make a lot of money. The problem with that strategy that I've seen, however, is that if your main strategy is trying to exploit inflated buy boxes, a lot of times you're going to see price tanking and you're going to see the price of that buy box actually come back to a more realistic price. Because at the end of the day, people who have Prime are definitely willing to spend more money for a book, but like, are they really willing to spend 50 more dollars for this book, especially if they can buy it for a cheaper price? So obviously some people are willing to do that, but the overwhelming majority of people, including people like yourself, probably wouldn't be willing to do that. So what I'm going to show you are actually Amazon to Amazon flips using Keepa, which is just a software you already pay for, which is about $20 a month. All right. And the first strategy is Keepa alerts. So if you weren't aware, you can track any product on Amazon in any category for whatever price you want. You can track it for the Amazon new price, the third party new price, or the used price. And so here's an example of a book. This is Jeff, Jeff pictures by Jeff Bridges. This book here, I actually picked up in a, in a thrift store. I had to go grocery, go, grocery uh, shopping. There's a thrift store right next to my grocery store. I just decided to pop in. This was just sitting there for five bucks. It was a great deal at the time. I didn't know that. I just popped in, scanned. I was like, dude, this thing is worth a lot of money. But then I went home and looked at his keeper graph and noticed that this is a book that over time tends to actually see very like see a lot of volatility in its price, but it's a book that inherently holds value. So what you'll see here is that this is an actual real screenshot of me buying this book on Amazon for $45. And you can actually see that I've sold it on Amazon three times for $170, $200, and the last time for $280. Bucks. And so this is kind of what I'm talking about. If you look at the keep a graph of this book, it kind of is very volatile, but it inherently holds quite a bit of value. And so I'm not actually, actually, I could show you the real, this is the real keep a graph right here. And one thing that you notice is this black use line is actually really high. So if you go over to the Y axis of this graph, you can see that basically this black use line, which represents the lowest use price on Amazon over the last year with the data that I'm showing here has really never been below 40 or $50, except for this one point in time where we had this repricing war between multiple sellers. And so one of the reasons why you would track products using this feature right up here, right above the graph, is so that you could fundamentally find books that become undervalued because of a few reasons. One, there are multiple sellers like Thrift Books or Goodwill who have really strong repricers and do so much volume that they don't even really care what they sell the book for. And so if they have really strong repricers, they can enter these repricing wars, which tank the price of a book really quickly. And so if you are tracking books on Amazon, you can get notified via text message, via email, via web notification to say, hey, this book met your tracker. And so you can see right now, I'm tracking this book for 65 bucks. I think at the time when I was tracking, actually, I was tracking this for 65 bucks. So you can see I got notified here. I looked at the Keepa graph and I said, okay, well, this book definitely can move for well over a hundred dollars. So, and it could even move for more than that. Like if I look back in April of last year, there are a few sales of over $240. It's like a sell at 225. So I'm really just looking, I'm really just doing heavy keep analysis to figure out what is this book sold for in the past? And is this book super undervalued at the point that I can buy it now and then just resell it for what it's worth? So you can see that right after this repricing war ended, the price basically of this book shot right back up because inherently this book holds significantly more value than what it was selling for at that time. And I was able to flip mine for well over hundred dollars, even a couple over 200. And you can actually see this happen again in December where the price of this book went from 150 all the way down to 44. And I don't think I was actually able to buy it then because um, 
I was too slow. Right now at the bottom of the chart, you can see there's 28 people tracking this book. So I'm not the only person on this listing who's tracking this book. But the point is, if you get really good at reading Keepa charts and figuring out the ultimate value, or like true value of what a book is, you can set these trackers for when there could be moments in time where people reprice the book incorrectly or they're repricing orders, then you can scoop it up and you can buy it. Okay, so just one more example of this, and then we can go on to the next Keepa feature is, so here's assessment and special education. Again, you can see I purchased this on Amazon for $43.51. I actually bought two copies of this and was able to sell both of these for $168. And again, you can see the reason why I was able to snag this is because this little black dotted line at the bottom of the graph here, this is the price that I was tracking this book for. And there is this point in time where over a very, I don't know, one day period of time, the price of this basically dropped and tanked, basically went on super sale. Not sure why, maybe someone didn't know how to price it correctly. They don't know how to read Keepa, but essentially I was able to get notified. I, was, I bought two copies and then I was able to sell them over here for over $160, okay? So first way is just tracking. And the way that you would track it is you would find any book on Amazon, pull up the Keepa chart. And right above here is this track product feature. And this is where you would enter in the value. So right now I'm tracking this for $65 in used condition from an Amazon or on for Amazon used used uh, price. Now I could also track it from the, for the new third party price or the Amazon new price, which we probably won't talk about Amazon to Amazon new condition flips, but um, at some, there are some times when basically Amazon will come in stock or a third party will come in stock with a book in new condition. And when it goes out of stock, it gets super inflated in value because people actually genuinely really want that book. And that gives you an opportunity to also set trackers and potentially buy new books and then flip them for in use condition for a lot more once Amazon or a third party goes out of stock. So track track product feature. If we go over here to Keepa, the way that you'd find find these um, the, the books that you're tracking is you just go to the main Keepa tab you'd come over here to this little track bell icon and then you'd go to your recent notifications. And right now you can basically see that I'm, I'm tracking, if I go to tracking over overview, I'm tracking, I think a little over 2,700 books, which is honestly not that many books to be tracking, but the goal is that, hey, throughout the day I can get notified if books become undervalued and then I can buy them and flip them for what they're worth, all right? So that's the first Keepa feature that's super undervalued. The second one that's super undervalued is the Keepa deals page. And so if we go back to this same Keepa homepage, on the top left, there is this thing called the deals page. And what you can do is you can choose a deal type based upon condition. So right now I'm looking at used books. You can limit a drop interval. So the same sort of idea here is you're trying to find books on Amazon that have seen a recent drop in price well below what they're actually worth. And the idea is that you would buy it undervalued and then just flip it for what it's worth. So right now, the way that I have this set up is I'm looking for any book that's seen a 50% drop in price and a $30, that, that which comes out to at least $30. And currently on Amazon, you can buy it between $1 to $33. And right now I'm looking at books that have a max sales rank of about $2 million. So me, me, I like to look at books that maybe take a little bit longer to sell because there's a lot of potential in buying books that don't sell very often when they're super undervalued and selling them for what they're worth. But basically what you would do is just keep an analysis. And so like, here's an example of a book that just popped up right here. Like, look at this. This is a keep a chart of a book that has many sales of over $40. You can see that this black line is basically not solid, which means that it's going in and out of stock all the time. But the point is when this book is selling, this book is selling for, for over $40. And right now the lowest use price just dropped. Like for some reason, the price dropped from $39.99 to $9.75. So why not buy this book for that price and then just flip it for 45 bucks and make some money? So this is the deals page. I'll show you a couple of books that I bought using this. So again, this is an essential fire department customer service book. I bought this for 25 bucks over here on Amazon. You can see I sold, actually bought two of these copies and was able to sell both of them for 160. And again, looking at the Kiva graph, notice that it's this repricing war that's happening. And basically I'm able to find books that just see a big decrease in value. And I'm buying them up saying, hey, this is super undervalued right now. Let me just buy it and then resell it for what it's actually worth. And make money that way. So I was able to buy it down here and sell it up here and make some pretty good money. Here's another example. This was an actual three volume book set, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Ancient Egypt. I was able to buy two copies of this for $21.77 down here when the price basically just tanked. The seller came on the listing and said, you know what? I just want to get rid of this inventory. I was like, all right, I'll go ahead and buy it because I see that the sales rank of this book has dropped for over $300. And so what I did is I sent mine back in. I was actually able to sell mine pretty quickly within a couple of months for over, you know, once for 198 and the second time for 250 bucks. So that's basically the Keepa deals page. The third really undervalued Keepa feature is the Keepa product finder. And the Keepa product finder basically allows you to, so the way that you'd find this is you'd go to this data tab up here in Keepa 
and you'd come over here to the top left, which is called Product Finder. And you can do essentially the same thing that the Keep a Deals page does. But here you can imagine or envision a product that you want to find on Amazon. And again, the product that I want to envision or find on Amazon is a book that holds some pretty good value. And then in the recent price, has seen a pretty significant drop in price because that might allow me to then buy that thing undervalued, undervalued and then just flip it for what it's worth. So this... This is a little bit more complicated, but the idea is that you envision the product that you want to find and you input the certain parameters. For example, like if you want to find a book where Amazon's out of stock, you would click that button. If you want to find a book where, you know, the use price is at least $50 or more, you'd say, hey, I want the current price to be $50 or more. If you want the 30% drop, the, the 90 day drop percentage to be at least 15% or more, then you could put that in there. And you could do this for literally any category on Amazon. Like I'm doing books specifically, but there's no reason why you couldn't do this for DVDs or vinyls or CDs or whatever, is, whatever it is you want to do. And so you can see with just some basic filters, it, it comes up with a whole bunch of products that you can then find and then you could source. And it's really funny because a lot of people say, Joji, do you ever go thrifting? I go, dude, I go thrifting all the time. I buy good, I, I buy books from Goodwill all the time. I just buy them on Amazon. I don't go buy them from the thrift store because you know that you know Goodwill has Amazon accounts with tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of reviews, like they're scanning their stuff in the back and they're selling it online. So take advantage of the, the features that Keepa allows you to have, because you can definitely find some really cool undervalued books. And here's some examples. Like this is a race relations book in America. I was able to buy four copies of this for $10 and 98 cents. And I sold all of them for over 50 bucks. And again, you can see why, like this was a point in time where this book held some pretty good value. Then it saw this insane drop in price. I was able to buy those copies and I was able to sell it slowly over time when the price of it recovered back to what it was worth. Now here's, you know, another example, Tennessee state of the nation, just a completely random book. I was able to buy five or four of these copies at 1575 and basically moved all of them to the same price at $99. And again, same thing. Saw a massive price decrease in price. I said, Hey, this has a ton of, ton of history showing that it actually sells and holds some pretty good value. So let me buy it now and sell it in the next textbook season. So that's the gist. Hopefully I didn't go too long. I have a Discord. I have a YouTube channel, the Joji's Book Flippers Discord. If you want to uh, check that out, uh, I can. you can just go over to my YouTube channel. They can go down into uh, the link. It'll be linked to basically the bottom uh, of any of my YouTube channel um, videos, but uh, it's free to join. And then also, uh, you know, I teach people how to sell books on Amazon FBA. I'm a high school teacher myself. Like I said, you don't have to go out to thrift stores to find books. I buy books between 10.30 p.m. and midnight and 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. I don't leave my house at all. I send my books to a prep center. They go to the Amazon warehouse, then they go to the customer. And then, I mean, I touch. I have to touch some books because sometimes they get returned. But um, I'm also live Saturdays. Change Saturday the address mornings. to the prep center. Say it again? Change the address to the prep center. Have them deal with it. You can do that. Oh, uh, I, I guess you could do that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, t I don't that do that. A couple might get lost, but... Yeah, I do it. You do do you that? Okay, maybe I should think I should look into that. Yeah, I, right now I have them all sent to my house. Um, yeah, just make sure when you return it, or I guess the customer would be returning it. Um, but like when we return like stranded inventory, we just put like we put like my my business name on it, so they know to attribute it to my account. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll that's that's something I'll definitely look into because I mean I do have books here that I need to get out as well. Um, yeah, so I'm live on my YouTube channel every Saturday, 6.30 a.m. PST. So again, the reason why it's so early is because I have a newborn and uh, I want to do all this stuff before he wakes up and after he goes to bed. So my goal again is to take all my Absolutely, Amazon income, man. pay for all my living expenses, invest over $100,000 a year between my wife and I, and then reach financial independence by the time we're 35. So that's my goal. Um, How old are you right now? I'm 28. Yeah. Nice. Hustling, man. Good stuff. Uh, I, I did drop your channel below so everyone go give uh joji a follow Appreciate on youtube it. and then uh let's open up some q a if you guys have questions let's go ahead and raise your hands oh we got bruce first in line what's up so bruce? bruce uh yeah i don't remember why i put my hand up now but uh so i think i'll pass you... i'll pass on to the next person okay right. cool who else has a question raise your uh we got city in here you want to mute yourself Hi. So my question is not for Joji because I had my hand up from Steve was on the phone on the line. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But I got disconnected. Um, it was about the um, ungated for the DVDs, the Christian. Yep. What was the site for? Christianbook.com. Christianbook.com. Great. And then another question. I could only ship out my Amazon packages on Mondays. 
um, should I still go ahead and like list them on um, Amazon and then wait for Monday to ship out or should I? Yeah, well, if you're, it depends if you're doing merchant fulfilled or FBA, but if you do FBA, you can ship every day of the week and not worry about it. If you're doing merchant fulfilled and you only ship on Monday, you would probably have to turn it off at least on Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. No, it's it's um it's fulfilled by Amazon, but my shipment because like I would pack. I'm gonna pack a box tonight. Oh, it's fine. You can ship it whenever you want. Oh, okay. So the price, yeah. I was afraid that it will drop. You can wait two weeks and ship yeah. it. It'll be fine. Okay. All yeah. right. So that's that's my question. Thank you. Yep. What's up, Damien? Hey, Romer. Um. So I was curious for Joji, before he mentioned it, I was going to ask if he used a prep center, knowing that his time is limited. Yeah. Um, but back to preps, so you already say, said you do. I'm curious if you've worked with more than one, if you've had pros, cons, um, the one you work with now, are they in a tax-free state? Do you like them? Are you willing to share who you use? Yeah, 100%. I use one prep direct in New Hampshire. It was a sales tax free state. That's before I even figured out how to get sales tax exempt on Amazon and eBay. So I didn't have to pay sales tax, but I used them for about a year and a half. They were pretty slow on getting the inventory actually to Amazon warehouse. They actually just shut down recently. Good thing for me, I'd already shifted over to the new prep zone I use, which is called Central Virginia Prep. And they're amazing. They pay about, or they charge about $2 and 25 cents per book in order to get it received and then shipped and listed on Amazon. And uh, it's been awesome. You basically have a spreadsheet where you record everything that you buy. You tell them exactly what you bought. If it's a hardcover, what condition it's in, they receive it. They say, yeah, this is the book we got. This is the right ISBN. This is the right uh, title. Um, it's in good condition. And then they, you basically tell them, hey, I got 50 or 100, 100 books. Let's send it off to Amazon. You send them a quick email, say, says create shipment. They're like, cool, let's put it in a box and send it to Amazon and then rinse and repeat. So that's Central Virginia Prep. That's why I use. They've been really great. They're not in a sales tax free state but I am now sales tax exempt on Amazon and eBay. So if you're not sales tax exempt, then you'd probably want to find one in a tax-free state. So if you don't know, there's basically, I think, five different states that don't charge sales tax. So the reason why that's really important is because if you send a book to a prep center in a sales tax-free state and you're not paying tax, then the money you save on the tax you would have paid actually goes towards paying the price it would have cost to get them to actually ship the book in Amazon for you. So basically, you actually end up making money by sending those books to a prep center in a sales tax free state. Um, one other really good one I've heard of for books specifically is Little Owl in Ohio. So I would check that one out. I think they're a dollar seventy five per book. I haven't used them, although I might contact them and say, "Hey, can I start sending some books to you just so I have a backup prep center?" But one thing I'll tell everyone with the prep centers is way easier than you think it'd be. You could literally call them today. You could sign up by the end of the day and say, "Hey, let's start sending books tomorrow." They're really easy to work with. Just tell them what you're sending. Yes, you can send them individual products. And they're really easy to work with, in my experience. Yeah, I will say Little Owl's good. I've worked with them for years. They're a little bit more pricey, but what I've learned with prep centers is you generally pay for what you get. So um, shout out to Frank at Little Owl. He's been in business for years. So generally, if you've been in business for years, you're not leaving anytime soon. Uh, Brenda, what's up? Let's get you out here. Yeah, I got a question about um keepa and i I've, I've been getting my nose in it going to the walmart just checking stuff and see how everything's working but when uh i understand that when you're buying those books when it goes down in value then when it goes back up then you sell it again but is there something that triggers um to let you know okay it's time to sell it or you just keep checking keepa every night good question yeah i don't i don't check every night to see if it's selling i basically just determine if the book is undervalued and think if there's a good chance that I can sell this to make profit and then I'll send it in Amazon and I'll use a repricer called Be Cool where I'll sit a min and sit, set a min in a max price and the min price will be profitable. It's basically the price where I say conservatively, this book should sell for this amount over a specific period of time. And then also I set a max price, which is me basically saying, according to Keepa and the historical data over the last 90 days or 180 days, this is kind of probably the max that it would sell out. And so the idea is that I touch well, I don't even touch the book. The book goes to prep center, it goes to Amazon, and then basically I set the min and max price. So, an example, like let's say I bought one of those books for 40 bucks. I'd say at the worst case scenario, this book should probably sell for 95. So let's set that as the min price. The max price is up to 180. So there's a lot of room in there for me to match the buy box and try to get the sale. But the point is, I'm just trying to go as fast as I can, buy as many undervalued books as possible. And then whether or not it sells for the min and max doesn't really matter to me. I just need it to sell. So that's kind of the way that I do it. Okay. 
Thank you. And I enjoy your videos too. <laughs> oh, great. I appreciate it. Uh, real quick, I don't know if you talked about this, Joji, but you can create a separate Gmail account and then on your phone, you can set notifications only for that Gmail account. Just Google how to do it. Uh -huh. And then you can set that account up with Keepa for notifications. That way you literally get a buzz every time one of the books drops below the value. And so you can be one of the first people to buy it. Yeah, so, it's, got, it's got a notification right there. The Keepa, oh, nice. you see the Keepa sign? Yeah. So you can- nice. Oh, Keepa notifies you. Yeah, keep a keep. Well, you can't have keep a notify you through Telegram. So you just have tell. Oh, I just have okay. Telegram do, downloaded. But nice. I'd same. I think the same sort of process is like you just want to know immediately when it goes down. Right? What percent of stuff that you buy is from a notification versus what percent is just from finding it and then buying probably, it? Probably about thirty percent is from the notification. The other seventy percent is from uh, Product Finder and also the Keep a Deals page. And then also I buy books on eBay, Facebook Marketplace, OfferUp, also online arbitrage as well. So it's not like the only source, but I would say Amazon is probably the easiest way to buy books because ease of experience and stuff like that. Yep, hundred percent. All right, Leslie, let's get you in here. I'm gonna ask you to okay. yourself, and we'll get Matt up next. Okay, thank you. Um, for question on the prep center, um, do you list it and then it ships to the prep center, or um, do they list it? So I basically check out on Amazon or eBay and I ship it to the prep center's address. That book gets shipped to the prep center. The prep center receives it. They have a spreadsheet where I log the book that says, this is what you should be receiving. They unpackage the book. They go, yes, this is the book. We're logging it on the spreadsheet saying that we got it. And then once they have 50 or hundred books, I say, all right, everyone at the prep center, can you go ahead and send these to the Amazon warehouse? So they say, all right, well, we'll go ahead and list all the books for you because that's what I pay them to do. And they'll, just like you would do, they use GoToLister or use whatever that they're using. They put it all in a box and they'll ship it off to Amazon Warehouse. Wow, wonderful. Um, I have a question on Keepa too. I sometimes see strange things on Keepa that I do not understand what they mean. Yeah. Um, sometimes the uh, sales rank chart, uh, mm -hmm. the green line uh, disappears. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes it reappears. Um, I know there's like with new items, there's uh, variations that it may not show variations if there's variations on a listing but I feel like maybe I get like 30 or 40 percent of it but there's just some things that are perplexing on Keepa that any advice on what to study to to get a better hang of what might be happening there yeah I think a lot of the time when the sales rank doesn't show up it's probably because the book has actually never sold and sometimes a book so sells so infrequently I'm talking like on the order of once every couple of years that it's really hard for Keepa to be able to collect all the data. And what you have to understand is that Keepa is tracking like hundreds of millions of products. So for it to be accurate all the time is really difficult. What I will say is that for books that do tend to sell, the Keepa data should be much more accurate and you should be able to see sales rank drops. So all I would say is make sure that you're seeing sales rank drops where you see the sales rank sort of go up in a sort of staircase fashion and then drop off a cliff, which would indicate a sell. And for those books that have a really weird sales rank, it's just a really small percentage of them. And I would just say that um, usually it's probably due to the fact that there's just not very many people buying it. And that that's why it's hard to collect the data. Awesome. Matt, what's up? Let me ask you to meet yourself. What's going on? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, cool. Um, so I have a couple questions real quick. Um, one, when you first started this model, did you have cash flow issues? Just because, like, based on the um, examples that you gave, it looked like those books only had like a couple sales per month. Right. So, like, it, like, are you sitting on your cash for a long time before those sell? And did you start with a lot of capital? You know what I mean? So, yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah. Much it. yeah. Uh, good question. Yeah, the average book for me takes about three and a half months to sell, which is a long time. So I use a, a system called Profit First. If you haven't read the book, it's from Mike Michalowicz. The idea is that um, you start with a certain amount of money that you're going to invest. So I think I started with about, I mean, I didn't read Profit First back then, but I probably started with around $10,000 that I'd saved up just from being very frugal. And that's money that I just have slowly rolled over. I basically have specific accounts that I'll funnel money into, but I have what's called a cost of goods sold account. And basically anytime I sell a product, I just replenish the amount of money I, I, I use to buy that book. In other words, every time I get a paycheck, I replenish the money that I had spent with before so that I don't have cash flow issues. And um, yeah, I, I would just say, I can't really summarize profit first super quickly, but it's a great book. It's it's basically all about cash flow. So yeah, in the beginning, if you only have 500 or $1,000, it's gonna be difficult, especially 
those books that drop less frequently, like you're going to have to wait pretty long for them to sell. So I would say if you want to have books sell more quickly, then one, buy fewer copies. You saw some of those examples. I bought three or four copies. So maybe buy one. And then also um, maybe look for books that have better sales rank. Like me, I like to go up to a 2 million sales rank because the less frequently a book sells, the more likely it is that that book can tank in price to a point where it's so undervalued that it's stupid not to buy it. So obviously it takes time for you to then list it and send it back in and for it to sell. But yeah, I would say I don't have cash flow issues now because I started with a certain amount of money. And every time I sell the book, I just replenish the cost of goods that was necessary to buy that book. And again, every time I get a paycheck, I also invest a small percentage. I basically invest 5% of the real revenue back into the cost of goods. So the, the idea is that the cost of goods account just snowballs and gets bigger and bigger. And now I'm to the point where it's like, I have to hire VAs because I don't have enough time to spend all the money to buy new inventory. Right. Did you ever leverage credit or? I use credit cards only for the sign-up bonuses. So I went to Miami, uh, shout out to Avery and Taylor. That was amazing. I went there completely free because I use a sign-up bonus. So I think right now the Chase Saf or the Chase Inc. Business Unlimited has like a $900 um $900 cash if you spend $6,000 in three months. So for me, I just took the normal spend that I was already doing and put it on a credit card for the sign-up bonuses. And basically I use that to travel the world. So I think my wife and I, we went to Hawaii for free for a honeymoon. Um, we're going to Vietnam this summer for free. Went to Miami for free. We're going to go to Hawaii again this um, this December as well. So I only use credit cards for uh, the sign-up bonuses and I obviously pay them off in full every month. And I don't, I try at least try not to spend more money than I otherwise would have, but yeah, I utilize them for not the leverage, but for the, the sign up awards. Perfect. And you're investing hundred K a year on top of that. Between, yes, you and your wife. between me and my wife, I don't do all hundred K. My wife is also a beast. She does like 90 K. You do like 10. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Go ahead, Matt. I just got two more quick questions. Um, yeah. One to initially start sourcing those books. Are you doing like storefront stocking using seller amp or um, are using any other softwares to find the initial books to kind of like snowball the process? And then secondly, how much inventory do you want to have before you start using a prep center? Ooh, good question. Basically, the way that I find the books is from the Keep a Deals page and the Keep a Product Finder, and then yep. also from Flipmind. So those are avenues for you to find the books. And from there, you do some heavy keep analysis and figure out, hey, is this book super undervalued? Like, is this a book that I can buy right now and sell back for what it's worth? In terms of uh, the second point, which was when to get a prep center, I would say as soon as you're limited in your your time, that's a great time to get a prep center. Because right now it's like you have two resources, you have capital and time. So if you have all the time in the world, there's really no reason why you should be using a prep center because you can save money by just hustling and doing yourself. But once you get to the point where it makes sense for you to be able to, um, you know, because you're running out of time, it makes more sense for you to invest in getting a prep center that say do that. That's probably... I don't know, could it be, I guess it's up to you. For me, I think I started when I had like 600 books in inventory. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for your time. I'm all set. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's get, let's get just Sean. You can unmute yourself. What's good, man? Hey, Joji. Yeah. What's just up? started watching your videos. Just wondering, um, so when you, I noticed that you had a merchant fulfilled uh, video on there. Yep. What, what what do you consider when you're trying to figure out um, if you want to send it into Amazon or um, just keep it on hand and, and ship it yourself? That's a great question. I like 95% of what I sell is FBA. The only time I would consider merchant fulfilling a book is when there's a competitive advantage to do so. So for example, if you buy a book that has really low stock quantity and then has the potential to sell for an inflated price, that's something that you want to take of advantage immediately. And it makes sense for you to list it now because there's a low stock quantity and you can potentially sell it for a lot of money versus if you were going to send that to Amazon FBA, it might take you two or three weeks for that book to get an in inventory. And by that time, other sellers come on the listing and the price comes back down. So the first reason would be take advantage, you know, it's a just competitive advantage, low offer count and inflate the inflated or exploit the inflated price. The second reason would be if you're in the middle of textbook season and you know it's impossible for you to get this textbook into the Amazon FBA warehouse at a time where there's a lot of demand, you might as well just list it merchant fulfilled so it can be listed live right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, just parting question here. Uh, so as far as like the prep center, I think I understood the gist of what you were saying, but do you have a video that would break that down or is that something like maybe I'll go into the discord and get an explanation on? Yeah, that's a video that I still need to make. Um, yeah, so I don't have a video on that yet, but 
the idea of it's really simple. You just buy the book on the site that you're buying it. You ship it to them. So you say, instead of your address, you use their address, they would receive it. Then they would basically say, hey, this is exactly what I was supposed to get. And then they would send it off to you know Amazon yourself. So yeah, that's something that I need to um, make, make a video of. And also, um, uh, Avery, I'm not sure if you're still here. I do actually got to head out because I, okay. I have to take my boy somewhere. So oh, yeah, it's perfect timing, but, actually. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks for coming so on, much. man. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. Uh, Yesenia, did you have a question? Uh, I might be able to answer Jody's question. You want to, I got to ask you to unmute yourself. Hold on one second. Boom. Should be able to go now. Yes. Um, just on the prep center, um, if, if that is just solely for FBA, if well, well, actually, no, it's not. I use prep centers for MF as well. Oh, Frank really? has well prep. He'll do MF for you. Yeah, I travel the full time. I'm here in Puerto Rico right now. So I use prep centers for MF as well. So you can use them for both. Just ask them beforehand. Some won't, some will. Um, Is so, there yeah. a different charge for like if Yeah, they... generally they have different pricing for MF or... versus FBA. Sometimes it's cheaper, sometimes it's more. Sometimes they charge storage unit our storage fees it just depends okay cool thank you 100 yeah. percent. all right guys it is time we'll get into more q a in a second uh everyone else who had questions um but it's time for the giveaway so first put the email that you registered for go to lister so put the email with your go to lister account below and i'm gonna have rustum take everyone's email put in a spreadsheet and we'll do a random drawing of all the emails so please just put your email one time below it doesn't increase your odds if you put it twice and we'll let everyone do that real quick and for anyone who's on the fence about go to lister if you want to comment why you're on the fence or if you just want to sign up just go to go to lister.com 100 free to try it out and um yeah we have free trial, fastest book selling software on the planet. If you get in now, you get in at the price for life and we have profit analytics coming soon. So currently you can see your sales here and within the next week, you'll be able to see uh, how much profit all this is too. All right, I'll keep Q&A rolling. So what questions do you guys have for me? And I'll try to answer. I know we have a wide variety of speakers today. So if you guys ask a very niche question about one of their topics, I may or may not know, but I generally know their business models pretty well. So, all right, guys, whatever questions we got, Kathy here. What's up, Kathy? Am I unmuted? Yep, you're unmuted. How you doing? Great. I'm, I'm doing good. I, I was going to listen to this not at home and it wouldn't work on my phone. So mm -hmm. I missed this I'm um, sad but um well, I know you're on your iPad right now because it says yeah. Kathy's iPad yeah I had to evacuate my home and um so uh, all I have is my iPad and my phone that's a whole nother story but um my questions were uh first of all how do you get to be tax exempt tax exempt just google how to set up a reseller uh, tax exempt license in your state. You could just type in how to get a reseller permit for whatever state you live. What state you live in? Texas. Texas, yeah. So in Tennessee, there's a process. It's different in each state. So, but it's not hard. It's just like set up an LLC or something. You just go online. Okay. Yeah. I right now I own, you know, a couple thousand books. I haven't been looking for books. I'm looking to sell them. I've gotten snagged. Um, trying to connect my bank account for some reason it stopped connecting and also everything now I've had a, a fulfillment by Amazon account for probably four or five years everything now says needs approval and it'll give me approval and then it won't list it um, and that's annoying and I don't know if there's an answer to that that's short. I also want to know if there's going to be a replay since I missed this. Yeah, I'm going to try to upload this to YouTube immediately, immediately after. Wait, so what was your question exactly? Well, I oh. keep, uh, so I keep getting, you know, I, I don't have any of these software things. Mm -hmm. I'm 
elderly, it turns out, they say, and I'm not real tech fluent. So I just use an iPhone and the Amazon on my computer and the Amazon on my iPhone and my iPad yeah. to scan and list. But when a lot of books nowadays, like a friend of mine just gave me a bunch of textbooks that you know would be great, except they all say needs approval. And what I find is then I'll ask for approval, grant me approval, and then it doesn't show up on my inventory on my computer. It takes 15 minutes for it to, to sync. So um, this is- Okay, just keep going. Yeah, just, just wait 15 minutes and it'll sync. Um, but yeah, on GoToLister, you can request approval and then you have to wait 15 minutes. If you do it in Seller Central, you request approval, wait 15, 20 minutes, and you should be able to like actually list it. Yeah, I've just been using the app on the phone, um, you know, the Amazon one. I haven't gotten any yeah. of these other things. That's one of my, and, and, yeah. Yeah, but uh, all of your gizmos are real exciting. Um, hmm. And I do sometimes thrift and, and wonder if a book would be worthwhile. And is a prep center really cheaper than uh because it looks like a prep center is, is it less time consuming if you have to it's certainly you know, less time consuming and it's definitely not cheaper you're paying for a service for them to list and prep for you and you have to ask yourself do you have more time or do you have more money is it more important for you to optimize your time maybe like joji and you're working a job that's paying you 60 70 80k a year and you want to optimize your time in your business and not work a 15 dollar an hour job you know, a fifteen dollar an hour job is prepping, prepping and packing books. If you could just pay someone yeah. else to do it, you know. So yeah. you have to ask yourself. Or maybe you're in a situation where, you know, like Johnny's more in the hustle phase, young kid, going out finding books, and he should probably prep everything himself right now. You know, um, so it just depends on where you're at. Because it seems like when you send it to a prep center, you still have to copy and paste or have a list of every book, and it's AS. And, and, and it's probably yeah, if you're doing online arbitrage, prep center is the way to go. If you're thrifting, uh, somebody else was asking in the chat, if you're thrifting, prep centers are rarely the way to go. Okay, thank yeah. you. I really uh, am grateful for everything you do. 100%. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. All right, I'm going to get sincere. See? What's up? Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm all right, man. Um, I actually had a, a question for the last uh, speaker. Yeah, I yeah, I might be able name. to answer. I, I, Joji, I've done some textbook yeah, arbitrage. Joji. Okay. Um, well, I don't do arbitrage. I was, uh, I, I experimented with it, but um, I actually sell in bulk. I buy okay. in bulk and I sell in bulk. And um, I come across a lot of textbooks. Um, a lot of textbooks. Now. I have a store, me and my wife have a store we've had for years. And we um when they when Amazon did this big wipeout where they 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 hit everybody's account and said that we were restricted from these publishers, all these different publishers, not just textbooks and everything back in like October, November, we cleared every single piece of inventory we had out. And I was upset mm -hmm. when just a week later they said it was a mistake. Oh, I don't know if you remember man. this. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, so over, yeah. This I was over exactly a thousand items. Yeah, yeah, it was over a thousand, thousand books we had in there um, at the time. High value. We just cleared everything out. So now we just started re-shipping inventory back in. And um, like I said, we come across a lot of textbooks and a lot of it's McGraw-Hill, Cengage, Wiley. You know, and we, 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 we sold plenty of that stuff and never had no issues, but we're worried about having an issue going forward with those kind of books because... It, you know, you can get sued. You can get sued. Are you, you are are you um are you restricted in many books or not really? No, no, we're not restricted because our account is like 12, 13 years old. What are your uh how many books are you selling like a month or a year? Well, we know? were selling we were selling uh roughly three, four hundred a month. Um, before we did that big wipeout. So we just got back into it this past month, but for the past four months, we shifted everything to eBay. 
we had shifted everything to eBay after that had happened. So we just got back into pushing everything back to FBA. Um, but we, like yeah, I said, we, yeah, got a lot I mean, of, we got a lot of info. We got a lot of textbooks, a lot of textbooks. You're but very we're about case. sending all of that in. Yeah, no, you should. You mean like in a sense you should be. Um, there's a very high chance that you're, you're, you could get test buys from the law firm that does this. Um, right, and that's what we worry about. Like we're not restricted in really none of it. Um, except yeah, for like the yeah. newest stuff. So, but, but we you don't, have a few we options. Yet, but we don't want to. Right, you have a few options. You can send them to Book Scouter, get instant cash. Uh, real quick, this is, this is just for you. It's not really for other people on this call because you have an older account and most people don't. You can kind of get an idea for what books are highly likely to be counterfeit by typing them into Books Run Counterfeit Calculator. Uh, yeah, we always use that when we list. When we list, we always run it through okay, that first. You great, know? And great. all the books say unlikely, but the thing is, like I said, we never had an issue ever, but you know, we stay in the groups, we pay attention, and we we see that a lot of people are catching these these lawsuits yeah. over listing stuff, and we just don't want to take a, a account that's good and you know begin to go full throttle again, full time. We got a warehouse and everything now. We don't want to push this and then have something like we we list the wrong textbook and then we get sued and it and it and it, and it freezes our whole account and suspends the whole thing. Um, so that that was my question for you know, him, what yeah. type of textbooks is he selling? Like, we just came, we just came across a lot of um, Jilford publishing and publication. We never had issues. We sent, like, 50 of them in. But You said you have your own, uh, have, your own space, like your own warehouse? Yeah, we have a warehouse we got. Okay. Um, well, potentially, another option is you could consider becoming part of uh, or reaching out to EPEG and seeing if you can become part of their best practices. Uh, this is like, I mean, if you're only selling three or 400 books a month, probably not worth it at this phase, but it, it's a legitimate concern that you have. Um, so with restrictedinventory.com, I've gone through several account shutdowns with this service. So I realized that like every, it seems like every million in sales we do, um, something happens uh, with like a counterfeit book claim. So okay. we partnered with somebody who's part of EPEG, not part of EPEG, but they're part of EPEG's best practices. Uh, Franklin mm -hmm. Media is the name of the company. And so like, and that's another thing you could do. You could send a lot of your textbooks to us. Um, we well, just signed up for restricted inventory downtown. We just did that a few days ago. Yeah, we yeah. so we, we, we have all of our counterfeits. We have all of our counterfeits checked. We have all of our books that are likely to be counterfeit checked. But another thing you could do, if, like you're serious about this book business, you could uh, look into EPEG, uh, counterfeit books, and you could reach out to this company and, and say, hey, I don't, I sell on Amazon and I don't want to, you know, um, I, never, I don't want to ever have like an account shut. You could just explain to them, like, I want to make sure the books I'm listing are authentic. Uh, can I go through your training and become part of the best practices? And it, it, that this is a commitment. A uh, huge commitment. So if you if you are serious about the book business, that could be. Oh, we a, are. That's why we got a warehouse, man. And we are. Yeah, it looks like they actually have Full like. Full time. A, they have a name. Wow, this is new. I've never seen this before. Uh, wow, this is kind of blowing my mind right now. Look, they have like a list of all the companies. Am I on here? <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, they have Franklin Media storefront names uh oh, this is this is new i'm gonna have to look at this after this call um anyway yeah that's my advice for that you either sign the deal with sign the deal with the devil and and become part of uh the anti-counterfeit practices which is a lot of politics involved with that but that could be a safe route if you're like trying to do this full-time full-time um otherwise yeah, well, we are full-time full-time but I, I don't know if i want to go necessarily that route <laughs> yeah no, another option in, in the meantime is go to bookscouter.com and if they're paying you know more for the book than restricted inventory like we pay you 50 percent of the profit and we cover prep fees so you can send it to us we just ask you to cover shipping which you can front that cost if you want to us um okay yeah so those are kind of like your two options it's good that you've already been looking at books run um 
obviously, you know, uh, they watch my YouTube channel, so they might even watch this video. They admitted to me when they watch my YouTube channel. So what I probably should say is go to stopcounterfeitbooks.com and go through the training here. But we did that and um, we still listed counterfeits. It's hard to avoid counterfeits. Like counterfeits are, um, they're hard to identify, but there's a whole training here. I have a YouTube video that breaks this down as well. But um, gotcha. you can go here and look for different uh, signs. So yeah, th that's my advice. Yeah, we'll probably just deal with your company for now. Um, restricted inventory, we'll, we'll be sending our first shipment soon. Actually, after we read over the information on how to send it to you. Um, and then the next question I had was um, dealing with uh, the repricer. We used Be Cool. Um, we used Be Cool before the shut, before that big sweep out we did. And we're back to using Be Cool again. But it's, it's a little different now because we was using the AI um artificial intelligence and and um it's a little different now the way be cool has it because they've added the conditional repricing now and a few other things and we just wanted to know what's the best triggers to set for what you know for what we're trying to do we don't want to tank prices so obviously we're yeah yeah, yeah. so i would do the same thing I, I like be cool be cool seems like a really good company and they have a yeah. beautiful user interface i just never tried them yeah. but basically what yeah. i would do is like chase buy box and then I would incorporate, I would, I don't know if people can do this or not. I think it can, but at nighttime price up from like 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., uh, price your books up, give them, give the price a chance to recover. And then if you mm -hmm. want, you can experiment with pricing up during the day. Uh, you don't have to do that, but um, those are like, do, if you just do that, if you just chase buy box for your, your fresher inventory and then price up at night, mm -hmm. I think that, I think that solves like 90% of the equation. And then as your inventory is getting older, we're dealing with capacity limits. Now, um, I would just try and sell it. I, I have a very aggressive model. I go a penny below after 90 days. Maybe you don't want to go that aggressive, but I just try to get rid of, of the stuff, you know? So that's what I do. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. 100% reach out if you uh, ever have any more what you've been questions. Doing, we're following you. Yeah. Yeah. I follow you. I've been following you for a few years now. So okay. I do take heed to what you say, man. Cause you've grown real awesome. fast. <laughs> real yeah. fast for a young guy, man. I appreciate yeah. you. I appreciate you sincere. All right. Um, let's see what we're where are we at, Rustum, with yeah, fields of profit as a video on how to set up be cool triggers, fields of profit is uh, uh, I think I we're gonna do it. Drop a, if you guys are interested in doing a, a an online arbitrage version of uh, like a boot camp, I don't know if we call it OA boot camp because it doesn't sound as cool as book selling boot camp. Type in OA in the chat if you want to learn like how to flip uh, strictly OA. Uh, that's what I'm thinking about doing next in the next couple of weeks. We got a lot of people in here. Avery, we got Avery Smith, Siegel, Phyllis. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's time for the giveaway. What'd you say, Rustum? You're still calculating? I can keep uh, answering questions. Yes, I'm still gathering participants. Okay. You can Big shout out to Rustum. Mind. Everyone give Rustum some love in the chat. He's, he's, <laughs> he's working hard. This is like, I yeah. put him under stress. I think it's past his bedtime too. Probably past all of our bedtimes. Not past my bedtime. My, my night's just getting started. I'm gonna go salsa dancing. All right, uh, let's see. Try to get somebody new. Matthew, what's up? Gonna mute yourself. He's on another planet. What's up, Matthew? You there? If not, we'll move on. I think he left the room. Uh, Jessica, how you doing? Uh, I'm all right. Okay, so I have oh. a couple questions here. Can you hear me? We'll get you next, Matthew. I'll get you in one second. Sorry, I think me. I'm sorry. So, so my, my we'll, question... we'll get you in one second, Matthew. I'm, I might go with Jessica and then you. All right, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me okay, uh, Rover? Yep. Okay. Good. All right. So, Keepa, so many questions, but I know we don't have any time. So, um, if we you got time, Russ, I'm still working. <laughs> okay. But other people have questions. So, Keepa, I feel like I missed that day they taught it in school. So, if you get it, I heard something about it being embedded into Amazon or something or embedded into Chrome or is it embedded? Yeah, in it's a Chrome extension. Have you never, online? have you never used Keepa before? Just the one on Scout IQ, whatever that is. I don't even know how accurate that is or how in depth it goes. You know how they have that little one on Scout IQ. I was going to ask about that too. Like, is that even 
something yeah, to consider? Yeah. So let me let me dive into this real quick. Um, that was my second question. So. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Let me share my screen with you real quick. So it is a Chrome extension. So it exists right here, this little plus icon in the top right. And I have mine set up to where it appears right here. Can you see that, how it appears? And then if I click yes. into it, I can see a more detailed version of this and it'll load. I have pretty fast Wi-Fi for being in Puerto Rico. As I nice. say that it takes forever to load. Um, it'll appear right here and then um, this is seller amp on the side. I use this for online arbitrage for like Nike products and different things. But um, Scout IQ is very similar to this. Scout IQ is optimized for books and you use it on your phone. You can also use seller amp on your phone. And the keeper graph on Scout IQ is going to look kind of like this. So this keeper graph is like a very uh, like sky level view of, of keeper. It kind of gives you like once you get good at reading keeper you can just look at a keeper graph and kind of know is it good or is it not yeah but yeah, yeah. this this keeper graph is like very detailed over here so the keeper right. graph on scout iq is not going to be this detailed so i can right. i can see this book went from 45 dollars to 91 dollars. which if i bought it for 45 and sold it for 91 100 i'm making a profit on that um and so this keeper graph is way 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 more detailed yes. and steve and i might do like a train on keep up seemed like you guys were interested in that so yeah. like there's so much to learn about online arbitrage with yeah. um with this yeah and so yeah um basically to answer your question scott iq is a simplified version of this but it probably gets the job done like maybe right. you just want to know like does the book sell at all yes so, I, I do and i do look at it for that but my question is when it's a busy green line and it's high and low what the heck does that mean because the black is the price right yeah, so the black's the price. You want to see that this go down. This is good. This means this is like top 1,000 selling book, top 5,000 selling. Like oh. whenever the sales rank- So it'll it doesn't sell, have, but it's got like a higher rank or something? Well, it's selling. No, it's it's low. So that means it's got a low sales rank. Right, it's but like, when it goes higher, it's selling. When it gets but higher, that means it doesn't sell. When it when it, So every time it goes down, like if we look here, we can right. literally, we can count the sales. Boom, sale, boom, right. sale. Right, but why are some of the dips higher? You know what I mean? Like there's some low dips and then there's some that go mid. And I, I don't know. So, so the way sales rank mid. works is it's always ranking the books amongst millions of other books on Amazon. But that's and the so, rank. Okay, I yes, got it. This, this, I this is the rank. So it's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down. If a sale happened, it, it goes down. Then it's going up again, then it's going down. So, um, so it's by the rank on the green and by the price on the black. And so it's yes. selling when it dips down, but it's yep. changing rank. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Got yeah. it. That's what my question was earlier. Okay. And okay. then book Z. That's my last question. So is that on the app store? Do you know, or do I just need it to- It is. Do yeah. The, it's in the app thing? store. It's very, okay. it's in very beta mode. It's free currently. So you guys go try is it, it out. Z Y or S Y? Z. Okay. Cause I couldn't find it. I don't know why. Okay. Um, there's Rustin, or actually Rustin's busy. Uh, there's somewhere in the chat. Um, okay. If you scroll through, if you scroll through the chat real quick, uh, there's a link to the app to the iOS store, but it's B O O K Z Y. I'm pretty sure. Okay. That's what I had, but I was looking on the app store on my iPhone and I couldn't find it. So okay, thank you so much for the time. Yep. Rustin, where are we at? We getting close. I think so. <laughs> how many? <laughs> how many? Are you just double checking everything? Nah, I'm still working at it. I'm currently at the. Okay. List. We'll keep we'll keep rolling then, Matthew. Yes, what's up? Yes, yes, please. <laughs> this is the sure. longest it's ever taken, Rustin. So that's a good sign. That means we've had a lot of signups. Um. Yeah. What's going on? I'm wondering. I have. I have. I do. F, uh, F, Um, and some of my books are coming back. They're, they're, they're saying that the prices are too high. And then when I go and look at the prices of the book, my book's not high because other people have the same book for that price, but they're knocking my book off saying my price is too high. What are you using to list your books or reprice your books? What two softwares are you currently using? Fix our list. Yeah. And what are you using to reprice? Uh, reprice it. Okay. 
just double check if you go to manage inventory, um, type in the SKU or the ASIN and double check that your maximum price isn't set. Like Accelerolist might have set it by accident, or maybe you set it. Make sure you're because it will deactivate you for high pricing error if you price over your maximum price. So, first of all, make sure that's not the case. And secondly, like sometimes it just happens, man, and you have to you have to deal with it. So as long as it's not happening like to all your inventory, just like a few, I mean, just reprice until you become active again, and then maybe try to price back up. But I've dealt with that before; it sucks. Yeah, the other thing is like like the other the other part of that equation is that uh, they'll say my price is too high, but I have a new book, and they're looking at the used book value, and there's no there's no new book pricing. So you have a new book? Yes, I have a new and book. Repri reprice it, we'll look at the used? No, no, when I, when, on Amazon, I'll have, a, I'll have a book, it's brand new. And all they have all they have listed for is used books. And that's the price they're going with. So they don't allow me to price my book as a new book, they, have, they want me to price as a used book. Gotcha, yeah. I mean, Amazon is doing everything they can to like lower prices, so. I mean, you have to deal with it and like just mess it around, try to price down, try to price back up, try to like go down by a penny. Um, channel max reprice is stranded inventory, so that's helpful. I don't know if reprice it does. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. All right. Yep. Sorry for not having the absolute answer for that. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yep. Let's get uh, Jeffrey. What's up, Jeffrey? Hey, what's up? Um, let me start my video. I just have a question. If you find a book that's brand new in shrink wrap still and Amazon's pricing it for like 40 bucks. I saw it. I saw it personally as new. But I would price it, if Amazon's on it, I would price 10% below Amazon. So you price below Amazon? Yeah, but if Amazon's I've, out of stock, what would you do? Price it like I would price anything else. I would just look at the market value and how much prime competition is there. If there's no prime competition, price higher. What's the sales rank? You know, price higher if it's a low sales rank. Um, but yeah, new books generally sell faster because there's less competition. Okay, gotcha. Yep. And one last question if you could get a book that has an e-score of 22, brand new for like six bucks and Amazon's out of stock, but it goes for 40 or Amazon was listing it for 40. Would you do like a test run by like three, five books or? I wouldn't even buy that many. An e-score of 22 is not great. Is there used books yeah. on the listing? Yeah, there's used as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd just pick up like maybe two max. A score okay. 22 means that it sells 22 divided by 12 like only like a handful yeah. of times a month so yeah if it i mean i give it an e-score of 151 then yeah i'd go deep on that but no i wouldn't with the, with the e-score that low okay yeah appreciate it 100 hey avery i'm done okay perfect i'm gonna get share real quick and then we'll we'll do the countdown if you want to share that with me in no pun intended in the group chat if you want to dm it to me It'd be amazing. Oh, be. I'll What's share up? the link. Share. Hey, Welcome. Avery. Is that I've, you been with you. I've been with you back when you were uh, beta testing. Go to list. Oh, were you share Alloway? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, uh, I've been using Accelerist and I don't do well with change because I've been through a lot of changes in a year with this program. Yes. Um, so I've signed up for GoToLister. Simple question, will I still be able to print like the 2D barcodes and put them on the boxes? Is that the new process no, with Amazon no. now? Well, no. okay, so what workflow are you using? Are you not using the one box method? I don't know what the one box method is. I use Accelerist, I pa I, I've been printing the 2D barcodes, slapping them on the boxes and sending them off, so. Okay, so this is what I recommend you do. We will have 2D barcodes soon um but because people are dealing with a lot of split shipments but what i recommend you do is go to go to lister.com and watch this video on the main okay. page uh, yep see. i just got that in an email because i just signed up today yeah watch that video it's the same video and then watch this in full basically we 
teach you to list one box of books? Do you get split shipments a lot? Never have. Knock on. Okay, you're fine then. You'll you'll be fine with GoToLister. I'm really close, I think, to the warehouse here. So maybe okay, that's got something perfect. to do with it. No, this will be way better for you then. Um, so you just list one box of books. And then like when you have a box filled with books, like close to 45 pounds, close it out. Stop. No need for box contents at all because everything's in one box. So you don't need to tell Amazon which items are in which box. So How uh, simple it's a much, that. Okay. much smoother process. And we will have box contents coming soon because a lot of people are having troubles with split shipments and it's a good solution. So, well, I, I don't ship as many. I started with you when you said don't ship a box until you got a hundred. That was your advice. So I went out and got 500. So, but I've changed my model uh, now. Yeah, I still say higher. that. But, you remember but, those days? Like, yeah, yeah, I still say that and start humble my yeah. course. I still say oh, that. It was good what experience. I mean is you find you find 200 books, but you're going to list one box at a time. So you list the box, ship it out. So you listen all 200 at once, but you close each batch out when you have one box filled. Well, I've changed my model to a lot higher cost books and higher profit. Nice. So I don't have as many boxes and books as I used to. That's nice. what I needed to know. I'm going to start with GoToLister tomorrow. Thanks. Awesome. Let me know how it is. And thanks for, you were along for the Indian version of it. That's when I hired Indian that paid <laughs> like $50,000 yep. to build the first version and it failed. And then I gave equity to an American and he's, he's an Amazon seller himself and he's been amazing. So I think Don's that like, helps when they know what we're doing times, actually yeah, firsthand. He's 10 times better than what they were doing. All right, it's time for the giveaway. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sarah. Um, Rustin, can you send me? Can you send me the spreadsheet? Yeah, I already sent it to you in the WhatsApp. Okay, let me open this up. How many people do we have total that applied? A total of eighty-six participants. Okay, that's actually less than I expected. All right. Did I get wrong? What'd you say? Oh, I said, did I do something wrong? Am I not a participant? I, uh, I sound off. I apologize. Drop, do we have Kathy in there? What's your last, what's, what's your email? I can uh, K -Doyle, one, K Doyle one at austin.rr.com. Yeah, she's Russell. there. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and I want to give a shout out to Natalie, Thanks. John, Carlos, Jules, Demarcus, Georgi, Kenneth, Diana, Gal, Lisa. Hopefully I pronounced a few of those names correctly. All right, 86 people total. Let me make sure this is a good spreadsheet. All right, perfect. All right. Um, I'll share my screen just so you guys know I'm not making anything up. If you want to, let's delete that top row. Look at Taylor over here on a coaching call. He's teaching people OA. Okay. Okay. All right, this is for the wireless Rolo printer. Here's proof. 92. Why'd you say 86? Do we have duplicates? It's 86 on mine. Oh, you opened the wrong sheet. Go to the March 16, second sheet. Oh, okay, gotcha. Gotcha. That one. Okay. So, all right, sweet. 86. You guys ready? I'm gonna click on generate. It's gonna generate a random number and then we'll see who this is. 15. And then you should be able to do the, you do the new this Denise Yates. Um, Denise Yates. I think she won before. You should be it's a random number generator, so it is what it is. I promise it's not rigged, guys. Denise, you there? She might not even be here anymore. All right, she won. Um, all right, that's it. I can't believe the same person won twice.
<laughs> I promise it's not rigged, guys. All right, thanks for showing up to AMZ Book Club, um, Books on Boot Camp. Again, we may, we may, she's in the middle. Denise, uh, actually, yeah, do you want to unmute her real quick? Rustum? There we go. Hey, <laughs> you won. Congrats. Yes. Thank you. That's what you this get for showing up live multiple times. Perfect. Nice. <laughs> hey, and this will work. That. And this will work for travel, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can take this with you. It's it's Wi-Fi, so so you'll be good to go. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Avery. Thank do you. Go address? to do Easter. Her, do we have her address already, Rustin? I think we do. Uh, yes, I think so. But I'll okay, reach if out not, to reach her. Out to her. Also. Yes, okay. yes, I do. Nice. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I think I'm going to do another one of these for online arbitrage in the next couple of weeks. So I know a lot of you guys want to learn more about OA, but um, I'll keep the book selling content coming to soon, coming as well. Um, much love. Thanks for showing up and see you guys soon. We'll probably do a low key version of AMZ book club next week. Just like a regular, everyone comes, we talk and just present, do some Q and A, nothing fancy. You can uh, you can allow people to unmute themselves now. How do we do that? I like it when people unmute themselves and say goodbye to me. <laughs> One second. Thank you, Avery. Yep. Uh, Rustin, you can let people unmute themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Oh, guys. Thanks, Avery. Avery. Thank this has been awesome. Yeah. Hi, Avery. Great to see you. Hi. Awesome boot yeah. camp. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, everyone. Nice to talk to you, Avery. Everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank